Hello, fellow misfits. It's the Halloween week, and we're just heading towards our second Halloween since we started this channel two years ago. Tonight's compilation will feature various true disturbing horror stories that will leave you sleep awake. Thank you for your support. Do subscribe. And now... Story time. Okay. This took a lot of courage because I've been ridiculed so much, for what happened to me. My grandfather owned a cabin. I'm not disclosing the location of it, due to the fact that I don't want anything to happen to anyone. Anyway, my grandfather's cabin was his way of getting the family together for the holidays, so he could have a nice Sunday dinner with all of us. One day, all of a sudden, that all stopped abruptly. He wouldn't allow anyone, but himself, to visit the cabin we all looked forward to going to and cherished. For years, I would ask him why he was doing that. He never told me why, but when he passed, he left the place to me. I inherited the cabin of my childhood and was ecstatic about that. It was soon after that, I realized why he did what he did. I would go out and walk the woods, on game trails, which are everywhere. I know these woods like I know my own home so I never had any reason to fear them. It was on one of these walks that I encountered what people call dogmen. I was walking, just like any other time. Nothing was different. It was then, on one of the game trails, I noticed an offshoot, small trail that went only six to seven feet back. I could see that something had bedded down there. I thought it was a deer. I then walked in the bedded area. I soon realized that this was an ambush point for whatever made this bedded area and it was massive. My arm hair stood erect and a chill literally ran down my spine. I felt as if I was being watched from different vantage points. Since it was nighttime, I had a tracking flashlight in my sidearm. The latter of which I drew and kept at the ready. I genuinely feared for my life at this point. All of a sudden, an ungodly growl was made to my right about 10 to 15 yards from me, very close indeed. I pissed myself. It was so terrifying. I didn't immediately run, fearing that whatever it was might take me as threatening. I turned and started heading back on the main trail and when I was about 5 minutes from the back door of my cabin, this thing let out a howl that I swear felt like it went right through my body. I then proceeded to run. As soon as I did, this thing was chasing me. For every five steps I took, this thing was taking one. That's how fast this dog man was. I heard the sounds of branches being ripped off trees and I could have sworn I felt the vibrations of it running after me. I barely made it to my cabin and slammed the door, locking the two dead bolts and chain lock. I then turned on my spotlight and shined it into the tree line. There were three sets of eyes in the tree line that shined vivid yellow, with enormous, black pupils. I felt as if the thing could read my mind, but I'm not sure it could. All I know is that I'm alive and have since heard them many times, but I don't take night hikes anymore and haven't for years. That night my buddy and I were camping on an open hill that is frequently stoked on by hikers during the days the trail is open. We were both having trouble getting to sleep so we decided to play some cards which I had packed in my bag at about this time was when our fire was getting quiet and it was dimming. The time was 1.10 am just minutes after I had taken out my cards and started dealing them out I heard the strangest sound, it's hard to explain what it sounded like but I'll try. It was like someone trying to gasp for air but in a creepy high-pitched sound the noise was sporadic and hair raising we stopped talking and gave each other a look he said it must be some sort of bird but in the pitch dark of the first morning hours and these were deep noises I heard, not some damn bird. I wanted to believe my friend but couldn't I started getting drowsy due to a long day of hiking. I fell into a light sleep still keeping in mind what I had heard. A rustling in some bushes had awoken me but not my friend. I sat up bumping my head on the hot lantern that had been out for almost 20 minutes. I looked around as if I could actually see anything outside the tent. I heard heavy yet quiet footsteps on the light dirt and gravel ground. 
Slowly I reached into the stuffed sack where I kept my skin diving knife as I was carefully sliding it out of the sheath I heard the crumpling of the power bar wrappers that had been already half eaten. That's when my friend awoke with the words what the hell is outside our tent. I didn't answer. The crumpling of the wrappers continued as it did a smell became apparent it smelled like rotten eggs mashed over a greasy sweaty athlete. Then a huge body rubbed against our tent from the dent in the dark I could tell this being was enormous. Eventually the smell was gone and we both were awake till dawn we had packed in the dark when there didn't seem to be a threat so when dawn came we quickly pulled down our two person tent and got the F out of Dodge. Ten years ago on my parents property near Colton, Oregon. When I came home after school on a Friday, I changed clothes, putting on my logger gear and went to work in the woods about 3.30 p.m. I had my work load cut out, it was to fall timber until dark. I was finishing up on this old skid trail falling snags when my saw ran out of gas. I refueled and sharpened the chain when I heard light thumping noises coming my way. I watched, thinking my brothers were coming, when all of a sudden a lone doe, dear, ran past me. She just missed hitting me, and I thought that was strange. I looked back, could not see the doe at all. Then I heard a commotion from where the doe came from, and all of a sudden a pure black seven-foot, human ape stopped in his tracks. When he saw me and ducked in the brush trying to go around. I packed my gear and ran home as fast as my feet could run. This looked like Bigfoot for sure. I'm a mail carrier in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Folks here are spread out over long distances and they still need to get their mail so every day I take a long drive out through the desert to deliver mail to the residents. In February 2023 I was out by the Valles Caldera National Preserve and I blew a tire. It was late afternoon it was going to be dark soon. The desert gets really cold at night year round. Even worse, Cell phone service is spotty around here. My reception was nil. My only options were to wait for a car to pass and hope they were willing to help. I could also hike up the hill and try to get a signal. Eventually, after I didn't report back, the post office would send somebody out to find me along the highway, but that could literally take hours and I didn't want to spend the night out here alone. I chose to hike. I could probably make it up and back just before dark. I just hoped that I would get a signal once up top. I was about halfway up the hill when I decided to take a short rest and a water break. I was sitting on a rock and taking a few sips from the bottle when I heard some odd sounds. It was like loud chattering. It reminded me of cicadas that I remembered when living in the eastern US. It seemed like it was coming from behind a rocky outcropping directly in the path. I didn't see any other route so I decided to just move slowly and see what it was. As I began to walk I stepped on a loose rock and lost my footing. I slid down a few feet before catching myself. The chattering stopped and I noticed something move out from behind a boulder. I saw a six foot tall thin insectoid with the head of a grasshopper. It had two large antennas on its head and a pair of large pincers extending from its thorax. There was another smaller pair of pincers beneath that. It moved quickly left and then right and then left again stopping 20 feet away. It was horrible. I didn't know if running and standing my ground was the best option, but after I took another look at its pincers I decided on the former. I slowly backed away mimicking its movements. It stood still as it watched me. Then my cell phone began to ring loudly. The creature's antenna snapped to attention and it quickly ran down the hillside. I instantly ran in the opposite direction, stumbling and falling as I moved. I eventually reached the bottom of the hill near the roadside, not far from my mail truck. I hopped into the truck and stayed put, hoping that the creature would stay away from me. I did catch a glimpse of the creature as it moved around the hill. I stayed put in the truck for several hours not daring to leave its safety. After what seemed like forever, a car came along and gave me a lift back into town. What the hell did I see? I have heard a lot of stories of strange creatures in the New Mexico desert but this was almost impossible to imagine. 
Of course, I haven't mentioned this to anyone other than my girlfriend. During the summer of 2017, I found myself cruising through Fort Wayne, Indiana as dusk began to settle in. It was one of those balmy evenings that make you yearn for adventure, and I decided to take a leisurely drive through the outskirts of town to clear my mind. The sun had already dipped below the horizon. My radio was playing an old, crackly blues tune. It was the kind of evening that made you believe in the supernatural, and little did I know just how right that feeling would turn out to be. As I rounded a bend in the road, a strange unease washed over me. I couldn't help but feel that something was about to happen. And then, it did. Out of the darkness of the woods, a figure emerged, running on all fours with an eerie, inhuman grace. It was massive, its silhouette reminiscent of some monstrous creature. The creature sprinted towards the road, coming closer with each passing second. My heart raced as I slammed on the brakes. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was something sinister. The figure vaulted over the car in front of me, moving with a speed and agility that defied reason. I watched in shock as it landed on the other side, its form bathed in the glow of my headlights. And then, just as swiftly as it had appeared, the creature dashed back into the woods on the other side of the road, disappearing into the night. I was left sitting there, trembling and bewildered, trying to process what I had just witnessed. It was the dog man, or so the locals called it. I had heard stories of this being, but I never truly believed in it until that moment. With a trembling hand, I finally put the car back into gear and continued my journey through Fort Wayne. So I wanted to share my story. I'm not 100% sure it was a crawler, because it wasn't tall but everything else matches up. I would also like to apologize for bad writing. This all happened in Lithuania. In 2016 I, female 14, was laying in the same bed as my younger brother and mom in her room because of the cold, both of them had went to sleep while I stayed up, reading. The only light sources were my bedside lamp and a crystal rock lamp in an empty brother's room across from us, for ambience. Having read enough I closed my book and turned off my light, laying down on my side, facing the other room. And there I saw it, a pale, hairless humanoid bony creature, kinda looking like the one goblin from Lord of Rings or the Rake, except it was a medium dog-sized. It was hunched over and had sharp claws and toes, as well as sharp teeth, its eyes were bright orange, red. The creature was moving inside the room across the doorway, on two legs, illuminated by the light. I got very scared and got up on my elbows, turned to look at my sleeping mom and whisper called her, yet she didn't react, suddenly, from my moves, the bed loudly creaked and I snapped my head back at the creature, locking eyes with it. Both of us unmoving. I blinked and looked at my mom again, calling for her and when I faced the room again the creature was gone, yet the image of his sharp bright eyes stayed in my mind. Moving forward a year later, I was watching a movie with my brother in mom's bedroom and we heard a crash in his room's walk-in closed. I decided to investigate what could have fallen. As I was walking to the closet, I saw a flash of white move quickly across it, the last thing being a white bony leg disappearing into a dark corner. When I moved closer I didn't find anything and nothing was out of place there. Years later I'm still wondering what it was and have had a few nightmares about it. I'm a park ranger for a national park in the US and this story I'm going to tell you has been hidden for years by my superiors but now I shall finally bring it to the light. When I first got this job they were very straightforward with answering all of my questions until we were driving along one of the dirt roads. Off in the distance, I spot a barbed wire fence surrounding an area of land on the side of a mountain. What's that fence for? I asked while observing it from afar. The park ranger that was showing me around looked to where I was pointing and I could sense fear by the way his eyes slightly grew wider. He focused back on the road and said, that's nothing. 
just a place to protect the wildlife and plants that live there from getting trampled on by hikers. His response made sense to me because I've heard of other areas being blocked off to protect the plants and such but his body language was holding something for me. However, I didn't want to be that annoying new guy so I just replied with, okay, makes sense to me. The man tightened his grip on the steering wheel as he stated, yeah just make sure to keep people and yourself far away from that area entirely. You know. To protect the plants. Feeling a sort of awkward silence between us I replied saying, will do, but if I may ask, what plant species are they trying to protect in the fence? The man's face scrunched up as he thought about how to respond. He then just said to me, you'll find out later what's back there but you haven't been here long enough for us to trust that you won't tell anyone about it so just hold your horses. After hearing this I slumped in my seat and listened to the rest of the tour of the area. When we got back to the ranger station everyone was welcoming me and introducing themselves and one man, in particular, stood out to me. He had sort of a Santa Claus physique with an especially white beard that had only small remnants of a grey color to it. When I shook his firm hand he told me his name was Paul Geyer but he goes by Ranger Paul. He was the main one in charge of foreseeing this particular national park so he took me into his office to give me all of the gear that I would need along with a schedule. What made you want to be a park ranger kiddo? He asked as he signed some documents that laid on top of his desk. Taking a second to think about how to respond I then said, you know, I enjoy the outdoors and thought it would be both fun and interesting to be a park ranger. He looked up from signing papers and said, are you easily scared? This question caught me off guard and wondered why he was asking me that. Anyway, I knew I had to respond so I said, I'm not really scared of that much. Maybe bears. Ranger Paul scoffed after hearing this saying, bears? Bears are the least bit of your worries here. We lose far more people who've gotten lost in the woods than people who've been mauled by bears. He pauses and looks out the window as he continues, it's the woods you have to worry about. How many people go missing here a year? I asked, trying to avoid an awkward silence. Too many is all I can say. If it wasn't for that darn. Paul stopped mid-sentence and turned to me. You'll see, he muttered as the park ranger who was showing me around previously walked into the room and pulled me out. Taking me to sign all of the required paperwork. As I was signing I could barely hear him talking to Ranger Paul saying something along the lines of, you nearly told him what's out there before he even signed the non-disclosure agreement. The rest of their conversation got muffled after the door closed completely. I was honestly intrigued to figure out what they were hiding beyond that fence. After that, I took every chance I could get to find out as much as I could about it but no one budged on what they originally told me until I had worked there for about three months. That's when Ranger Paul decided I should know what was behind the fence. He pulled me into his office on a stormy day when we weren't checking if people had paid for their camping tickets and said, I know you've been interested to figure out what was behind that fence and you will but promise me that you will never tell another soul about it. I promised and he continued. You're not going to like what I'm going to tell you because it's quite anticlimactic. The reason we have that fence to keep people out is that there is a stream of water up there that just pops out of the ground from some source within the mountain itself and flows for about 20 feet before it again disappears back into the mountain. I interrupted saying, that's really not that unusual, I mean it could just be a spring popping out from the ground. Paul raised his hand up to quite me as he continued saying, you're right, but that's not what's unusual about this. The water. It flows. Upstream. It goes against gravity and all other forces of nature as it flows upward on the mountain for 20 feet. Perplexed and intrigued at the same time I said, really? If it does why put a fence around such a scientific marvel? People would come across the world to see it. Ranger Paul smiled as he said, that's what they first insisted on doing but. That place ain't right. It's cursed or something. I asked him what he meant and he responded by saying, most of the people who discovered went missing and were never found. Those were the lucky ones. For the ones that didn't go missing they somehow were morphed into deformed humanoids without the capability to speak. One, however, 
could slightly speak and all he said was, Hell's entry. After he said this I knew he had to have been playing a prank on me to haze me or something but his expression never changed as he said, that water going against gravity is some sort of an enigma. The place is like the Bermuda Triangle. A sort of place trapped between dimensions. Crap like that. The government tried to study it but after losing half of their scientists who were researching it, they gave up on it, leaving it locked up behind that fence. As he went on I didn't know if I should have believed him or not because it was so outlandish of an idea. When the storm clouds moved out of the area, Ranger Paul sent me back out to check if people had paid for their campgrounds leaving me with this last sentence, don't ever go over that fence. A few days soon passed by after this and I couldn't deal with the explanation that Paul gave to me. It just didn't make sense and so one night I snuck out and decided to hike over to the fenced area. I took a pair of wire cutters to cut through the fence because I didn't want to try and climb over the bob wire that was wrapped around the top of it. When I finished cutting out a small hole I would be able to fit in, I brightened my flashlight as I heard the trickling of water. Following the sound, I soon stumbled upon the stream and its magnificent beauty. When I shined my flashlight at the water it was almost as transparent as glass. Ranger Paul was making the whole thing up when he said the water went backward against gravity. To my utter amazement, I reached my hand down into the stream and felt the push of the water towards the top of the mountain. I was elated due to how beautiful it was and wondering why anyone would ever want to hide something like this. As I was touching the water I heard something splash in the water and glancing over I saw a man crouched over on all fours with his back to me. Startled by the man's presence and wondered if he was lost I got back on my feet and walked toward to him. Are you lost, sir? I asked as I placed my hand on his shoulder. His head turned around to meet my gaze and my heart stopped. All he had on his pale blank face was a mouth full of sharp-edged teeth. Stumbling backward, I fell into the stream which felt strange as it tried to push me up the mountain until I pulled myself out. The thing didn't move at all but just sat there mumbling fragmented sentences. Freaked out I darted to where I came and the thing somehow sensed my sudden movements and inhumanly crawled after me. It climbed into a nearby tree and tried to pounce on me all the while I could hear it say in an uneven tone, save me. Hell. Gates. Freaking out I noticed that the ground underneath me was shifting and gravity was coming in and out. The world around me seemed to change back and forth but I kept in the same direction and saw the fence ahead of me where I cut the hole out of. It kept changing from a fiery cave wall back to the fence until I quickly made it there but it was a cave wall by then. There was no way for me to escape now until it swiftly changed back for a fragment of a second. Taking the opportunity I jumped through the hole in the fence and the thing tried to follow after me but didn't make it through. Its screams still keep me awake at night. After this ranger Paul later found out about it but didn't fire me on the spot. Instead, he said, after being in there, you're the last person on earth who would ever want to go back in so I'm not going to fire you. He did instead gave me all of the crappy jobs for two months afterward. That happened around four years ago but still, I'm not supposed to be posting this story here due to the non-disclosure agreement I signed. I guess I just broke that agreement because I need to warn everyone that if you find a random area in the woods fenced off, whatever you do don't try to break into it. You just might not make it back. It was about three years ago, in November 2012, when I was working at a small gas station in northeast Louisiana. We were the only small shop and 24-hour service station near Bastrop just off the highway. I worked the night shift. I loved it. The sharing of stories with the traveling customers, that is when the rare customer showed up. It must have been around 2 AM. I was cleaning the floors and locking the beer coolers when suddenly the lights went out. I pulled out my cell and used it as a guiding light until I made it back to our counter where I kicked on the gas generator. It lit the parking lot, the bath and the hall leading to the register. When I looked outside, I could just make out the movement of the trees across the street, but, otherwise, it was pitch black. 
I turned on the radio and started listening to a local station with its night owl DJ, commenting on the heavy winds and cracking jokes between songs. Suddenly, I saw some figures in the dark. I could just make them out. They seemed to be a group of kids on bikes. There were three of them. Two of them dropped their bikes and made their way to the door where they just stood there staring at me. I just stared back for a moment, waiting for them to come in. They never did. I moved around the counter and opened the door. What's up guys? Out kinda late aren't you? I asked them, expecting them to come in. Can we use your phone? One asked, their heads tilted kinda low. I felt a little worried as I pulled my cell from my pocket and offered it to her. Sure. She looked at me and then I saw her eyes. They were solid black, almost like ink filled orbs. No, I need the real one. She said, her face twisted into an angry snarl. I pulled the door closed and flipped the locks. No. No ma'am, you go home and get your mom's phone. They stared at me through the door for a minute longer before turning away and biking off. The next day I had my boss check the cameras to get the pictures of the creepy kids but the cameras had been off the whole time. Now the cameras run off the generator instead of the hall lights. I never saw the kids again. For the past few months I have been noticing these white things in my security camera footage they are in the trees and make the trees shake like it's a tornado beneath and make the trees sway back and forth. At first I thought it was the police watching me but then I keep seeing so many of them in one place there is no way it's that many cops. They are white and have like a black slit for eyes and a round black nose they are very sneaky. Once one was hiding behind something outside and kept peeking around looking at my cameras like it knew I was watching I have numerous videos and footage of all this I tried posting to YouTube but everyone thinks I'm crazy. It's really starting to bother me because I dunno WTH is going on with these things back when I thought they were cops I called them piggy wiggies so let's call them that these piggy wiggies move in the trees in like a jerking motions. And climb up and down tree very fast. I have footage of these piggy wiggies if you don't believe me. I'm into classical antiquity and thought maybe I had summoned some demons or something when I was trying to speak Latin to these telemarketer that wouldn't quit calling me every day all day so I said some crazy stuff in Latin hoping it would spook am off like Mercury knows what you did the Babadook is coming for you there will be no mercy so that's another thing I thought. I know what you're thinking but I'm not crazy. Um K? Anyways please help if you have any idea what they piggies wiggies are thank you. I'm staying in Pigeon Forge near the Smoky Mountains right now, in a cabin in the woods. There's other cabins nearby, though. I was dead asleep last night and my boyfriend was still outside in the hot tub and he came inside yelling for me and woke me up. He said that he started hearing something big moving around in the forest, and he thought it was a bear, but he shined his flashlight and it was like something small moving through the grasses that he couldn't see. There were multiple of them but they were covered by the grass and moving in different directions. He only saw one, but it was a little ways in the distance, and he described it as long and tan and skin colored like a person that was on their belly slithering around but moving really fast and graceful. Then clear as day he heard a woman's voice scream help me. Someone. And he says it was the weirdest sound, like it didn't sound like a real person, it sounded rehearsed and fake, and he couldn't tell where it was coming from. Anyone know what this is? We're freaked. I've seen what I believe was either an alien in disguise, a hologram beamed down by aliens, or some other sort of trickery they were using to lure me towards them so they could abduct me and my friends. Here is my story. It was 2001, I was driving my car on the Blue Ridge Parkway near Asheville, North Carolina. My three friends and I spent the day at a nice place called Graveyard Fields. I was driving us home, sober by the way, late at night. We were chatting normally when all of a sudden I see a two to three foot tall all white squirrel standing upright at the edge of the road. 
My headlamps illuminated it as I drove by and it turned its head to make eye contact and follow my eyes. I instantly had the thought, that is not of this world. I turned to my friends to say, did you just see that? All three of them were instantly asleep with their heads tilted to the side and resting on their shoulders. I was flabbergasted, we were just talking seconds ago and now all are asleep? About 20 seconds later I saw a second identical one, same exact thing happened except I knew my friends were already asleep. My mind was racing, I looked at the clock, I don't think we lost any time. Then the girl in the front seat started waking up and I excitedly told her the story. Then we saw a third one, identical to the first two. She was equally freaked out by it. I don't think they got us. That's the end of the story. However, a couple years later I flipped through the pages of a book about UFOs, I think it was Communion by Whitley Stryber. I randomly opened the book to a chapter with a drawing of an all-white deer with big black almond-shaped eyes. In the book, he interviews lots of abductees. There is a category of abductees who claim they were in the woods when they saw an all-white animal with big black almond-shaped eyes. When they walked towards it to investigate they were abducted. This is a true story. Has anyone else ever heard of this phenomenon? I live in Florida and although I've traveled a bit I always felt this is home. My family is originally from NYC but we've lived here for quite several years. I was young and was living with somebody in a trailer out in a horse pasture. There was a campground, Mayaka State Park near Sarasota, just on the other side of the pasture, and we had made friends with the people who ran it. It was late summer and a bunch of the campers got together because they would be leaving soon to go back home, so a bonfire was being held that evening. There was a trail that led into the campground from where the trailer was, and everyone had gathered at our trailer for a farewell BBQ, then moved down to the campground after for the bonfire. After I had cleaned up the BBQ mess it was getting dark, so I was pretty much the last one to arrive. The fire was started and we all stood around talking, it was about 9.30 pm. I was standing beside my friend on the outside edge of the fire when I happened to look across at the tree line. There is a fence there with low-lying palm scrub, it divides the other half of the pasture from the campground and back trails. As I looked in that direction I saw two big red eyes staring back at me. The outline of this thing was pretty big by the glow of the firelight. The palm scrub is about 4 feet tall, higher in some spots. Not taking my eyes off this thing I quietly whispered to my friend to look in that direction and don't scream. She did and she whispered to her husband. He said softly to the group not to make any sudden moves. We were talking softly and alerting everyone in the group about the red eyes, and everyone looked and saw what we were seeing. There were eight of us all totaled, my girlfriend's husband returned with a flashlight and rifle in hand. He handed the flashlight to my friend and told her to shine it at whatever was in the scrub. When she did this thing stood up and made a growling sound. My friend's husband then shot at it and it screamed like nothing I'd ever heard before. It took off into the brush and everybody, except me, in the group ran to get flashlights and whatever to arm themselves with. My friend and I were told to stay by the fire. About that time we heard the horses screaming in the pasture and they hurried to the field. After a while they all returned, they could not find anything and would resume the search at daylight. The next day blood was found at the fence area and a horse was dead, its neck was broken and its body was badly ripped apart. Searches were continued for a couple of days and no one spoke about what happened. After several things happened where I was staying we left. This was not the only time I have encountered a large red-eyed being, I believe this was in fact a skunk ape or Bigfoot, that after being shot at purposely killed that horse. I have on another occasion encountered one again, at night which chased me through the woods while walking home from my friend's house. I had not known at the time that a body was found mutilated in that area and that the arms of that poor soul were torn from their body. I was lucky.
The brisk mountain air filled my lungs as I stepped off the charter bus and stood in front of the green forest of a Virginia nature park. I was here for a company retreat at an expensive cabin resort a few miles down the road. It all seemed like a bit much, but I was never one to turn down an extravagant gift. As one of the medical liaisons for the company, I was responsible for speaking with physicians about new drugs we had coming down the pipeline. I dabbled a bit in marketing as well to help bring focus to our more lucrative products. Though I'm still trying to get that added to my job description with a pay increase. I wasn't very passionate about it to be honest. I was having my first life crisis as I approached 30. The light of fluorescent bulbs was a poor substitute for the sun and looking out the windows of my office only served to torture me with prospects of the outside world. I wondered if staying in the office all day just to fly to other offices and convince doctors to buy the same drugs with a different patent and brand name was worth it. I was usually a complete homebody, however, once upon a time when I was a little girl you couldn't keep me inside. I spent the better part of my childhood and hormone-ridden teenage years exploring the woods and rivers near our house in the Pacific Northwest United States. Hell. I begged and pleaded with my parents until they allowed me to sign up for outdoor survival camps. I think it was sometime during college that a sudden bout with depression had killed that hobby of mine. The habits of staying inside on bright sunny days had entrenched itself into my leisure time. However, at the behest of my therapist, I decided to pick up hiking and running outside in nature as much as possible. I forgot how good the air felt in my lungs and the feeling of triumph when I ran just a little bit faster for a little bit longer that day. And while hiking I had taken to snapping pictures of wildlife with my iPhone. Even with my salary, I couldn't justify buying an expensive camera when the one in my pocket did well enough. I'll be back every two hours and the last pickup is at 7 p.m. If you need a ride after that you'll have to pay for someone from the hotel to come and get you. The bus driver's gruff tone snapped me out of my haze. He gave me a lasting look for a moment. Make sure you mind the park rules. It's in yours and the park's best interest. I was a bit confused as he pulled off. I pushed it out of my mind and tied my braids into a short ponytail as I headed toward the visitor's center. It doubled as the command station for the park rangers and was a moderately big one-story building with large windows that ran from the side of the building facing the road to the large double doors in the front. As I entered, a welcome center greeted me to my right with an open circle of couches and a center table. Surrounded by a few smaller beat-up tables and chairs, and upon a long table with a leg propped up by old magazines sat an old coffee maker with cream cups and sugar. A woman with brown skin, dark freckles, and curly brown hair shoved under a ranger's hat leaned over and grabbed a map as I approached the greeter's desk. Hello miss. She smiled I assume you're here to enjoy our wonderful nature trails and take in some sun. Been looking forward to it as a matter of fact. I brimmed back and looked at the town maps and photos from across the decades. I kinda always wanted to slow down and live in a small town like this. It's not a bad town actually. We're close enough to a city to not be a dust bowl, but it's pretty quiet outside tourist season. Y'all got here after the summer rush. Had to kick out a few visitors for causing some property damage and uh dot we're still looking for a couple of others. She solemnly avoided eye contact as she turned toward a sign on the wall. Well, we only have three rules here at the park. Absolutely and under no circumstances are you to leave the trail now listen. No matter what you see or hear, do not disturb the bare carvings along the paths. If you haven't seen one in more than a quarter mile or roughly 20 minutes, or if you see any broken ones then you turn back immediately. That was an odd way of putting it. No matter what I saw or heard, they seem to take forest preservation very seriously here. I nodded in acknowledgement. For sure for sure. What about photography? I've kind of. Absolutely no photography once you've passed the fence post here. Her face grew stern and she looked me directly in the eyes as she circled a marker that was about a mile from the entrance. Also, and this is an unofficial rule, but you may have the opportunity to see black bears in the area. 
The same rules apply as the carvings. Leave them alone and no pictures. We can't risk having them chased off. Ah, uh, thanks, I guess. See you in a bit then. I folded the map and put it in my pocket. The park closes at 7.45 p.m. so that gives you some time before sunset. I would not suggest being here at night. Rangers may not be able to find you. I nodded hesitantly and left the station toward the hiking trail until I came upon a small wooden booth next to a bulletin board. I was glancing at the papers put up for the day and quite a few were missing persons. It was always sad seeing these people. I thought maybe this is why they were so strict about the trail. Were the circumstances around the disappearances really so bad as to elicit such strict park rules? People like you end up on that board cause they don't listen. I was startled by the gravelly and disgruntled voice of an older ranger, sporting a salt and pepper goatee. He had to tilt his head down slightly to look at me. I was briefed on the way here, thanks. I responded annoyed. You people never listen. I do everything I can to limit how many of you outsiders come here. They should just shut this damn place down, we already don't get enough funding. He stared off into the forest. But then, I didn't like the undercurrent of superiority that dripped off his tone. I'm fully capable of taking care of myself, I stated as I firmly pushed past him. The ranger was silent as I hastily jogged down the path. I noticed the waist-high bear carvings mentioned by the woman in the ranger station. The surrounding forest gave me chills as I made my way down the twisting trail. I couldn't argue with the park's inherent beauty that dispelled my uneasiness. I approached the first one-mile marker and took it all in. After a few moments I looked upon a split path, the trail on the right, flat, even, and covered in footprints from visitors. The higher gradient laid to the left. Well, I do like to get a workout. I thought to myself. Plus, there was likely to be more wildlife on the path less traveled. Maybe I could sneak a few shots in. A few minutes up the path and the sun was beginning to lift my mood despite the heat of the rays bearing down. I began to feel that all too familiar high from being outdoors again. Well hello there. I was startled and looked over to my right. Behind the tree line, their backs to the forest, stood a man and his wife wearing disturbingly wide smiles. He stood upright while she had her arm around his waist, both sported matching blue tank tops. Everything below the husband's waist was obscured by foliage. They kind of looked familiar, but something was off. Like she was holding on to him to keep herself from falling. Maybe she was just tired or injured? Nice day for it isn't it? He gleamed. His wife still silent beside him, her smile not faltering an inch. Ah, yea it truly is a beautiful park. I haven't seen any wildlife in this area yet. I assumed there'd be quite a few here. Hoping for at least a black bear. I looked further up the trail, but from the corner of my eye, I saw the man's smile twitch ever so slightly. Ah yea, dear. I think they're just afraid of the trail cause of the people. Sun's really barren down today. His wife finally spoke, but who the hell spoke like that? The sentences barely flowed together like a badly cut remix or post-mortem album. We saw some deer just behind us when we left the trail. We can show you. The wife nodded in a gesture behind them. I took a step forward then froze. A faint rancid smell wafted through the air and a sense of malice, directed toward me, came from deeper in the woods. Every part of my brain screamed at me to run. That's that's fine. We're supposed to stay on the trail anyway and I don't want to upset the park rangers any more than I have. Don't be ridiculous, said the man in a strained, almost staticky voice, still smiling. Shouldn't his cheeks be hurting by now? Just come on through. Can't see the good stuff if you stick to the rules. I'm fine. Really? Maybe I'll see something up ahead but I need to keep my heart rate going. Good lie Nina, really using those sales tactics. I do deserve a raise. The man's smile twitched again. Okay, he said slowly. Without another word, he and his wife took off deeper into the woods. The gait of their walk was weird too as if they were tied together in a three-legged race. 
Maybe she sprained her ankle, but by the time I thought to call after them they were gone. I continued up the trail for another 20 minutes and the trees had receded a bit, giving room for nice grassy areas to relax in. As I thought to cross the threshold kept by the wooden bear beside the trail, I heard a strange noise. Was that? Was that something whimpering? I looked to the other side of the trail and lo and behold, a foot behind the other bear carving was a red fox laying on its side, one of its back legs completely twisted around. Oh no, you poor thing. What happened? The fox looked at me with vaguely human eyes and continued to whimper and pull itself toward the woods. The poor thing was so scared. It whimpered and barked and yipped. Chirp. Chirp and chirped to pull at my heart stri. Wait. It sounded like a child doing their best impression, but. I know I heard it. I stopped just before I was fully in the grassy patch, my back foot still in line with the bear carving. The fox froze and stared at me from the corner of its eye. As I started to back away, it turned toward me with a horrifying scowl. It rolled over onto its belly and. Slithered? Crawled away? Its limbs moved, but slightly out of sync with one another, its broken leg no longer an issue. Now that I think about it, it was more like a puppeteer trying to mimic walking while dragging it deeper into the woods. Crunch. Snap. Crunch. The distinctive sound of footsteps making their way through the forest. Was it the couple from earlier? I thought they had gone a different direction into the woods. Were they following me? I took off into a jog. But as I continued to hear the footsteps around me, I began to run. The sound of snapped branches and broken leaves came closer and closer. I began to sprint, but no matter how fast I ran the footsteps were right behind me. It must be them. The timing matched that weird walk I noticed before, but how would they be able to keep up with me like this? Fancy seeing you again. I pressed on the balls of my feet, stopping so hard I nearly fell over. The rancid smell began to fill my nostrils. In the trees right before the left path in a fork in the road, leaning a hand on a broken bear carving was the couple. Their front unobscured. It was like someone had shoved the bottom half of the wife through the husband's torso and melded them together. She hung forward on her husband's left side and held herself upright on a broken bear carving. Three legs supported them the center a peg of twisted and gnarled flesh broken off at the ankle. Something had clearly misunderstood the architecture of the human body. We didn't think we'd see a ca catch up to you. Choked out the wife. We thought we might have heard someone call. I'm so cold. It hurts. And wanted to make sure you was alright. Safe dear. It's just not safe. Keep run running safe in the forest. The husband stuttered out once again mimicking random lines from a tape recorder. The smell grew stronger and I could feel that menacing presence on the trails to my left and right. It was all an encompassing and suffocating darkness that corrupted the soil, the animals, and the very air itself. I needed to get away, I needed to run to the only place I couldn't feel a sense of dread, and before I knew it, I had taken off straight down the middle of the fork into the woods. Faster and faster I ran, hearing the clumsy clambering of the coupled monstrosity behind me. I felt the cutting air of hands that barely missed the nape of my neck as I ran. I attempted to cut perpendicular to the straight path I had been running, hoping I would run into another path again. The footsteps behind me began to grow distant and my lungs were on fire. I ducked behind a large rock and tree, trying to quiet my exasperated breaths. Are you okay, miss? An echoey voice called out ahead of me. A man stood in a ranger's uniform. This head hidden underneath his hat. Come here, miss. Away from the forest. Not safe. I didn't notice the jerky extension of his hand as he beckoned me toward him. Neither did I notice the return of the rancid smell that had stalked me earlier. I just wanted so badly to believe I was safe. I started to stand up and walk toward him. But he lifted his head and all that was there was a shifting dark void of tendrils inside a cavity where the man's face had once been. Watch out ma'am. Get back. Gunshots rang out from the void. Still. Hungry. 
Bored. With this one. You. Are desired. A croaky whisper emanated through my head. I fell back into a sitting position and held my head in my hands. The entity stepped toward me with an abysmal purpose, its hand extended, jerking back and forth at the wrist. Darkness enclosed around me and my vision blurred. Everything was getting so cold. There was a deep roar in the distance. An intimidating and hungry roar that grew louder as it approached. Oh God, what the hell is going to happen now I thought. I must be in the maw of the beast, my insides soon to be devoured. I'll just be a hollow husk. But then nothing happened. I sat for a few seconds as a roar sped past me and a wet nose sniffed at my face. I opened my eyes to a black bear, large and drooling, inhaling me deeply before chuffing and chasing off after two other bears further into the woods. I forced myself up, my legs still a bit stiff with fear, and tried my best to orient myself back the way I came. I quickly built up to a run, following the specks of orange sunlight that grew more frequent the further I went. I might be closing back onto the trail I ran from earlier and relief began to wash over my body. Hey friend, fancy seeing you again. Hey! You stalking us? To my left, effortlessly galloping along. Was the couple. Dark tendrils had burst through every orifice in their face, snaking and grasping at the air. Their faces were still twisted into smiles that now hung loosely from broken jaws. The wife bobbed to and fro, grabbing nearby trees to pull themselves closer to me. They started to scream in agony, begging for mercy, their last words played back at wildly varying tempos. I began to see the trail again and the distinct outline of a wooden bear, I could do this I told myself. Just run a little faster, just a little faster, just. Jump. Thwack. I landed hard. I looked forward to my fingers that fell just short of the trail. Then there was the sound of a person being tackled followed by a vicious roar. A few feet from me an old scar-ridden bear had put all his weight on the couple. The flayed trees to the side of me indicated he had charged in perpendicular to us. Two adolescent black bears had their jaws around the couple's neck and face. One bit down, cracking the face and skull like an egg and began tearing at the dark tendrils inside. The other tore their head off entirely and tore at the darkness like crab legs. They were eating them. The old bear sniffed in my direction, inhaling deeply as the bear deeper in the woods had. Disappointed, he turned his attention back to their kill and began to work his way through the torso. I thanked every god and spirit for the hungry animal that saved me. The sun was setting by the time I had emerged, and night had blanketed the sky as the ranger booth came into view almost an hour later. The park ranger I met on the way in, stood with three others, including the head ranger who accosted me earlier at the notice board. Prick. Son of a bitch. There she is. The old ranger walked briskly over to me. The young ranger from inside the station had her shotgun raised. Put that damn thing down Rita. If that thing was inside her, she wouldn't have made it past the carvings. He glanced over to the wooded area that snaked with the path behind me. Besides, she ain't gibbering at us from a meat suit. Shell actually. They're more like. Hard shells. I huffed out as we passed the notice board and I saw the familiar missing photos of a middle-aged couple in matching blue tank tops. Beside them was the photo of a young park ranger, leaning on a wooden bear and smiling. Once inside the station, they sat me down on a couch and brought out a blanket before giving me a bowl of leftover chili from upstairs and a Gatorade. I poked around at the chili in between small bites. My mind was still trying to wrap itself around the events of the day. The head park ranger sat next to me, his hat in his hands, the thinning hair on his head turning gray. I lost my protege to that thing. Kid had his whole life in front of him and he wouldn't listen to reason. He knew. I mean he just knew that he had heard them calling from the woods. He sat up a little bit straighter. He never believed me much and that's fair. Most people here don't believe until they see a deer standing upright, a bird bobbing up and down in the sky like a goddamn cartoon reel but goddamn it. He choked back tears and rubbed his temple. 
Nobody was ever stupid enough to actually go in on their own. You could just feel something was wrong, but you. He pointed at me. You've seen it, you've survived its tricks, and you didn't do anything to hurt it, but you goddamn survived it. He rose to his feet and put his ranger hat back on. I stared out the window for a moment still in shock of what happened, but the sheriff's point about survival struck a chord in me. I learned a lot today about how parks work, and I suspect you might have an opening. The old ranger looked at me quizzically before a slight smile crossed his face. The position wouldn't be super fancy, but I imagine it would allow someone to slow down a bit if they were interested. Help us get what we need to keep the people safe and certain wildlife confined. And that's it. That's how I came to live my small town dreams as a park ranger in Virginia. I took over marketing and after a couple of rangers said they'd started seeing more cubs further up the trail, I've pushed the idea of us being a black bear sanctuary. As such, the public was encouraged to stay on the trail for a clear and conscious reason instead of a vague horror movie warning. We've raised a lot more money this way as well. We repaired the broken bear carvings on the trail I was on just a couple years earlier. We have no idea who made them or where they come from, but we've tried recreating them with varying results. It's just a hunch, but I think that thing can't tell the difference between a fake one and a real one if it's carved just right. The current world situation has really given us the time to get our ducks in a row and sure up any safety holes as people were stuck at home. However, our state has declared that it is opening up again soon and people are antsy. This town saw its fair share of tourism before, but other parks in the US have reported waves of visitors in numbers they haven't seen in a while. People are hauling their families and friends anywhere that isn't home, and this is a problem. We are going to lose people, but I don't believe that number has to be significant. So why did I tell you all of this? Is it to warn you against going to national parks? No, I fully believe you should patronize them as much as possible. We need the funds. But I am saying that the world out there holds horrors you couldn't imagine. Hell, from what I've heard from rangers at other parks, everyone has their own, problems they have to handle. All unique in their own way. So please, come out and enjoy yourselves. Just abide by park rules. Oh yay, and please stop by the gift shop on your way out. All proceeds go to the park's office of operations and donations are always welcome. Ask for Nina in marketing and project management for more details on how you can help. So I made a post a while back about something I saw in Michigan when I was in 5 to 6th grade. I moved to SC a few years after that. I haven't seen anything since. I've been back several times never saw anything like it again. So I'm driving home a couple buddies today and all three of us see this white thing on all fours book it across the road. We all don't know what it was. It was fast. It looked like its legs were maybe bent 90 degrees at the knee to the side. It was all white no idea if it was fur or skin. It was so fast we could only catch a glimpse of the legs. I damn near hit the thing with my car. We were all a bit spooked but we were trying to think nothing of it. My one buddy is pretty spooked so he invited a friend to come stay over. That friend who was going to stay over saw the thing too while he was pulling into my friend's neighborhood. I should point out I live less than a mile from this friend and the two sightings were less than a mile from my house. I live in a pretty big area but you can get some woods here and there. I'm installing a dash cam tomorrow. I've had it forever I don't know why I haven't installed it. We aren't sure what to make of it but we are all spooked so be spooked with us. The Neighbors I'm not sure if this is where I should tell this story, but I guess I'll start somewhere. Me and my wife moved into our home a little under two years ago. The first year we had some interesting interactions with the locals of our new town. They told us stories of our home and the father and son who had both passed away in the house. The father of old age and the son of a heart attack shortly after. I was on the fence of believing in the paranormal until we started noticing objects moving like our dogs balls and toys at first. 
until it turned into larger objects like shoes and decorations. Odd objects that didn't belong in our yard showing up on our back stairs, things like door hinges and random pieces of ceramic. The house across from us was assumed abandoned even though we saw people every now and then going inside. Until recently when a middle-aged man showed up to live there. Immediately after moving in he got two young pit bull puppies. Both of them were white with brown spots in them. Me being a smoker I go out nightly around 11 to 12 for my final cigarette. I noticed some strange noises coming from the backyard and never really thought much of it. The other day my wife asked me if the grey dog had always been over there. And now I noticed that the second white and brown dog had been replaced with a grey dog. Nothing I was very stressed about. Until tonight. While out on my smoke I noticed a pack of deer in the field behind the neighbors. Normally our deer are terrified of humans. But this man just calmly walked through the pack as if they didn't even notice he was there. He bent down to try and pet his puppy who seemed to growl and back away from him. He looked over at me when this happened and slowly stood up and continued into the home. No lights turned on when he went inside. Being a little freaked out by this situation I made my way inside slowly. I sat on the couch for a few moments so I could look out my living room window and keep an eye on his house. Still no movement or lights for about 10 minutes. Then the blinds slowly slid open that faced my house. I turned off the lights in my home and made my way to the bedroom where I'm typing this story. If anyone has any idea of what's going on I'd appreciate some help and advice on where to go with this. I was thinking maybe a skinwalker, or a watcher of some sort. Maybe one of y'all have some information I could read into. I'd like to share these stories because it has always bothered me that I have not found an explanation for what I have experienced. About six years ago I was living with my mom in a house built in 1914 in the city of Redondo Beach, California. It's a bit of an outdated house but the yard is huge and the home is cozy. When we first moved in my sister heard a little boy whisper in her ear come play with me we brushed it off and told her she must have been dreaming. However, my mom later experienced countless encounters with said little boy as well. Incidents were so far apart we kept brushing them off as half a sleep day dreaming nightmares. Until one night I experienced something that didn't let me sleep for days. I got up to use the restroom around midnight the bathroom door was cracked open and I could see through the bathroom mirror that my sister's boyfriend was standing behind the door. I awkwardly waited for him to get out since he was taking too long and I really had to go. I even began asking him if he was alright. I could see him clear as day not moving. I then switched on the actual light, we had a night light in there, and there was no one in the restroom. I used the bathroom in shock because I convinced myself I was imagining things. Went back to bed and laid there frozen. A few weeks went by and then again I got up around midnight to use the restroom. This time I saw my 6 foot 1 little brother standing behind the door with his grey sweater he just got for Christmas and his fresh haircut. I knew he was trying to scare me I mean come on it's my little brother. I start yelling at him to stop and get out now. He doesn't respond so I say that's not funny and push the door all the way back. The door didn't hit anyone. This time I screamed and ran back to my room. I begin to pray. I knew this time I 100% was not imagining anything. After, I prayed and put a religious verse under my pillow I never saw anything again. Not sure if it worked or it was a coincidence but a year later I moved out. My mom still lives there. We recently celebrated my son's birthday at the house. It was dark and we were picking up the trash when we hear a little boy outside the gate saying mommy open mommy we run as fast as we can to open because we think we locked my two year old nephew out of the yard. When we get to the gate. No one was there. My nephew was inside safe and sound whole time. Story time. I don't usually hike, but my friend, whom we'll call Desmond, hikes 24-7, especially at night. I remember one day he invited me for late night camping. Basically, we hiked in the woods, 
and he wanted to go up a mountain. Even today, I ask why the heck I agreed to this. I've been in nature a lot to understand that something was awfully wrong with that forest. No animal sounds and no sounds of bugs, absolutely nothing, not even mosquitoes to let you understand. For a good 40 minutes, it was peaceful until we got to the other side of the mountain. I remember Desmond telling me, hey, do you see houses down there? Now, thankfully, I've got good eyes and saw what seemed to be seven abandoned houses circling each other. Desmond said to me, want to go check it out? Of course, being cautious as ever, I said no, but he started calling me a scaredy cat for not saying yes. Finally, I gave in, and we went to check it out. Moments later, when we approached the houses, somehow it was very quiet, too quiet, to be honest. I told Desmond to get out of there because this place was too suspicious, and he told me that there was no way a human could live here. But that's when we heard footsteps from the woods, heavy yet slow footsteps. We went to hide behind some bushes, and what we saw was a woman with a lantern walking around and sobbing as if she had lost someone. I saw, though, that she was holding a knife in her left hand and was chanting something. I kind of heard her saying two things, curse them and their children. While I was extremely frightened, Desmond seemed even more scared than me, which surprised me since he is braver than all my friends. We sneaked our way out of there, but when we got back across the mountain to go to our car, we saw the same woman behind us, only without the lantern, and she started chasing us with her knife and what seemed like a hatchet in her other hand. We ran like there was no tomorrow, and her screams filled us with more fear, making us run even faster. Once we reached the car, we left the woods. By now, the sun was rising, and we finally got to town. What I'll never forget, though, is that we had stopped at a store to get some drinks, and I said that I'd wait outside for a bit. I saw a poster on a street lamp. It was the face of that woman on it, and the poster said missing. My girlfriend and I had a cryptid sighting along Route 40, just north of Brookville. The sun was still up, just a little before sunset with thin, high clouds, so there was plenty of light. I was driving, and she was looking at me as we were heading west on 40, engaged in conversation. Then I saw her eyes widen as she gazed past me through my window. She practically screamed, what the hell is that? And pointed across the field we were traveling parallel to. I looked to my left and saw something huge and black, with a massive upper body, running like a bat out of hell along the edge of the woods. She watched it for a good 30 seconds as it ran along the edge of the woods until we lost sight of it when we passed a house close to the road. She kept going on about it, half panicked and excited, until we got home, which took about three to four minutes from the point of the sighting. Finally, we got home, and I asked her what she saw exactly. She described it as a big black thing that was running faster than any deer or human could move. It had a big upper body, but we couldn't see any major details due to the distance across the field. She said, it was one of those things, wasn't it? After the encounter, I introduced her to the NADP site, but I also asked her if she had seen anything strange in that area before, like animals acting oddly or going missing, and she confirmed that such incidents had occurred over time. So, this is my dogman sighting. On July 4, 2012, at 2 p.m., I saw a dog man cross my path in front of my bicycle. This beast was only four feet away from me. Its snout was over a foot long with absolutely ferocious teeth. Where we typically have whites in the eyes, this one had yellow. The inner part of the eye was green and had a very piercing appearance. I would approximate this animal's weight to be about 220 pounds. This isn't late night hikers, it was my mom taking six-year-old me for a walk while we were camping in Washington back in the late 80s. We were Canadians on vacation, and didn't know the area. It was just us, 
walking along the banks of the river at dusk and playing in the trees when I remember starting to feel weird, like someone was following us. I thought maybe my dad was playing games with us. Except it was pretty clear my mom felt the same way, because she started hissing at me to walk faster and be quiet. The feeling got stronger, and stronger, and then I felt my mom grab my hand and tell me to run. We just kept running until we hit a road, and flagged down a car who took this petrified mother and daughter to their campground. The name of the river? The Green River. They found another victim of the Green River killer, Gary Ridgway, a few weeks later, in the area where we were exploring. It has ruined my ability to walk through the woods by myself. The woods by where my father grew up have an old abandoned house or houses, I should say, scattered throughout the woods. I'm from the Hudson Valley, anyone from that area knows the woods there of old houses or, at least, the foundations remaining. Anyway, when my father was younger, he and everyone else basically would climb up this mountain to an abandoned house. He said it had old black and white nudes, but a lot of kids would go up to smoke and hang out so a lot of the things were just smashed. Part of the trip up the mountain basically involved climbing up a cliff, blanking on proper term, just a flat rock surface that you had to scale. This was also his usual way down. So one night, he went up alone and was working his way down. Night was settling in, and as he was lowering himself down the drop off, he felt an odd presence and glanced upwards towards where he was just standing. Basically, what he saw was a quick glance because whatever it was just made him climb down the mountain and run home. He described it as basically very tall, lumbering above him and covered in hair. It wasn't a bear, at least from the glance he got. Normally, you take things to your parents and tell you if you have some doubt. But after a recent trip to his mother's and her sharing some of his stories that he told, it just made it more believable. There's also that hole you'll see what you want to see so who knows. I'm terrified of heavily wooded areas, to be honest. I am so frightened right now, and it's hard to put these words down. I had to take a quick break. My encounter may seem mild compared to others, but it still physically shakes me to my core. On a hot summer night in August of 92, my mom, dad, two of my brothers, and I decided we would get a Papa John's pizza and head to the Dixie Twin Drive-In Movie Theater. It was our 21st our payday family ritual. I have another older brother, but he had already moved out. After finishing our pizza and the movies, we headed out. But Daddy decided to take a drive and detoured to another part of town. We ended up on Shiloh Springs Road in Trotwood, Ohio, a suburb of Dayton. As we cruised along, Enjoying our late night ride, I noticed that there were no cars in front of or behind us. It was all of a sudden eerie and dead silent. As daddy drove up the road a little more, I was looking out of the rear window and heard him say, what the heck? I turned around to look out of the front windshield and was in horror, astonished, and paralyzed. There aren't enough terrible words to describe the level of fear we were going through. He slowed to a complete stop. The headlights on our 79 Buick had caught this tall, gray, stringy-haired creature with pointed ears and some kind of muzzle. It had yellow, sort of glowing, piercing eyes that made me feel like an ant. I have never felt so inferior in all my life. The creature crossed the two-lane road and disappeared into the woods in three steps, but not before looking through us, like it wanted us to die. I felt pure hatred coming from this beast. He was mad at us for looking at him. I keep saying him, but I honestly didn't see genitals. I guess I just felt that it was male. He could have smashed through our car and destroyed our entire family. I've seen my beloved daddy scared twice in his life, and both times it was because he felt his death was coming. May he rest in peace. This thing had a face, not just an animal face. It was like he was smart, he was walking, and he owned us for those few moments. Finally, my mom said, Ronnie, go. And he sped off. I cried for a few minutes, but after that, 
something strange happened. It was like all five of us were entranced, on some kind of autopilot. We went home, went to bed, and totally blacked out the incident, like he put some kind of spell on us. We never even spoke of it again. But after I became a mother and a wife, my husband and I were talking about Bigfoot, and I sat up, and my memory snapped. I said, Brandon, I think I saw Bigfoot, and I told him the story. He quickly corrected me and said, no, you didn't see Bigfoot, you saw a werewolf. I will never go camping or enter a forest or woods of any kind, nor do I allow my children to. That thing has supernatural powers, and it let us know with its eyes that we were nothing and it would kill us in a second. This was 26 years ago, and I still am overcome with emotion and fear. I just wanted to share in hopes that it would make me feel better, like maybe a weight would be lifted. I doubt it will, though. Thank you so much to anyone who takes the time to read my experience. Just thought I would report this as a potential dogman hearing, not a sighting. Multiple co-workers of mine in Shelby County, Tennessee Medical Facility have heard a strange creature screaming and making crystal clear sounds behind the facility. It is well lit, fenced, but there are woods behind, and also a river bottom near. Three separate people have heard the noise, two together, one at an earlier time last summer. This most recent event happened within the last month. When discussing it, the third person confidently says that they had also heard the noise in the pre-dawn house while getting something from their vehicle and couldn't believe it. So they had never mentioned it to anyone. After hearing the details of what the other two heard, the third person confided. All three are medical professionals, have outdoor experience, but cannot identify the creature making the sounds. They describe it as being loud, crystal clear, and even though it was from an obvious distance, the call was loud enough to be heard clearly from within a running car with the defroster blowing. This occurred at twilight, roughly 6 to 7 am. Also, since this occurred near shift change, there were several ladies coming into work who obviously heard the noise too and rushed inside the building as observed by the two who were leaving. A couple of years ago me and my friend were walking home from a party through some pretty rough neighborhoods, anyways, it was quite a long walk home and the clock was like 2 at night so nobody was out. Suddenly, a pretty old truck turned on the fog lights on his truck and literally blinded us. While we were walking around confused he hopped out of his truck and said something like what's up boys? Talking a little walk all by yourself huh? He was probably around 45 years old and really big. We answered with something like excuse me what do you want? And he said hop in fellas, I'll take you home. We politely said no thanks but he kept on pushing us, at this point me and my friend started to think the worst and we both were pretty scared. We took a couple of steps back and he whispered to me that we should run for the nearby woods. So with this plan in mind we tried to distract him from us by talking about his car when we suddenly just ran for it. He didn't run after us or shout to us or anything but we ran as fast as we could for like 3 minutes straight before we felt somewhat safe. Both of us were shook and just walked silent back home. Now we joke around with it a couple of times but I still remember how scared I was, I was probably around 15 when it happened. Never saw that guy again. Sorry if some of the language was weird, I don't speak English that well. I was on a four-day canoeing trip with friends in a remote part of the southeast United States back when I was a young teen. We were up late, built a bonfire, and goofed off as young boys do. I'm sure we were making a lot of noise. Eventually, the fire died down to just coals and we just sat around it talking. When we heard a distant high-pitched scream, it freaked us out for a little bit, but eventually, we forgot about it and went back to talking. A while later, one of my friends pointed to the opposite bank of the river and said, guys, what is that? We looked, and standing there in the trees was a huge silhouette of some figure watching us. It was faint but illuminated by the full moon, and it was huge. 
We just kind of stared at it in shock for a moment before backing away. We went to get our friend's dad and some flashlights. He was intent on showing us that nothing was there. We got back to the spot, and it was still there, so we shined our flashlights on it, but it wasn't enough to get a better look. The thing shone red with the reflection of our flashlights. We watched it watching us for a bit, and it walked up along an embankment and then walked back and disappeared into the woods. That was more than a decade ago, and we rarely talked about it. We were all pretty freaked out. Finally, a chance for me to tell my story. About 10 years ago, my family and I were up in the White Mountains of Arizona to cut down our Christmas tree. My dad was driving our truck with my grandfather in the front seat, and my mom and sister in the back seat. I was in the bed of the truck along with our family's German short-haired pointer. We were driving along a forest road, and all of a sudden, my dog starts barking and growling. So I look to see what it is, thinking it is maybe a bear or mountain lion. What I saw was a tall, dark figure walking parallel to the road, just about 60 to 70 yards away. I yelled at my dad to stop the truck. When I told him I think I see Bigfoot, he just laughed and continued to drive. When I looked back to get another look at it, the figure had changed directions and was walking away from the road. The last thing I saw was the thing's head disappearing down a hill. To this day, I still do not have an explanation for what I saw, and every time the situation comes up, my dad always makes me tell everyone my story just so he could laugh. Myself, along with four other guys, decided to park on Anthony Road and walk out to the middle of a field to have some beer. We lived in a small town with not much to do. Keep in mind, however, that we hadn't yet started drinking, and even if we had, I don't think it would have caused a group hallucination. The reason we had guns was due to an incident prior to this, where my female cousin and her friends, who were all about five years younger than us, came back to my aunt's house one night very scared. They said that they were driving down Anthony Road when a guy was lying in the middle of the road. They had to stop the car since it's a narrow road, so they couldn't turn around. They put the car in reverse to back up, and just then, the guy in the road jumped up and started chasing the car. People came out of the cornfields, trying to open the car doors and stop the car. They took off in drive, came back to the house, and told us what happened. Hence, the presence of guns the night of our encounter. The night we had our encounter was very bright. There was a full moon, or near full, shining down on some pretty thick fog that was about shin high, so visibility was quite high. We drove up and down the road once, just to make sure no cops were parked anywhere, and then we spotted the field we wanted to go into. It was really cool looking with the fog lying heavy on the ground, and the moon bouncing off of it, giving a really cool glow effect. We parked two cars and began to venture into the field at the area where tractors would enter. We walked about 20 or 30 yards in and stopped to listen for cars and to make sure no one else was around. One of us noticed something large and dark along the wood line to our right, about 150 yards out into the field. We all stopped talking and watched it for a few minutes, trying to determine what it was, a tree stump, large rock, bush, etc. After a few minutes, we decided it was just a big bush and stopped paying attention to it, walking further into the field. After going into the field a little more, one of us noticed the object wasn't there where we had seen it before. We began to scan the area to see where it went, and then we noticed something running from right to left across the field in front of us. It looked to be about three feet above the fog line, if not four feet. That would make it bigger than any dog. The way it ran reminded me of a cheetah or greyhound dog, reaching out with long forelimbs to grab the ground and then hurling its hind haunches under itself to spring forward again. Its silhouette looked like a wild boar or hyena, with a stereotypical large hump on its upper back. It ran really, really fast to the center of the field and then turned directly towards us. I've never seen anything able to change direction as fast as this thing did, 
especially considering how fast it was traveling. At first, we thought it had stopped running, but then after a second, we were able to tell it was now coming straight at us. We were all asking and commenting with each other, trying to reason what it was, dog, cougar, bear, etc. As it continued its charge, we raised our guns at it. I had a shotgun, and two of the other guys had pistols. When we raised our guns, it began to zigzag. I remember thinking that it knew what guns were. I remember saying, or one of us said, that thing knows we are pointing guns at it. I think that's when we got creeped out enough to run for the cars. My buddy, the Facebook guy, said he didn't shoot because he couldn't identify the target. I personally, and am not ashamed to say, think it's because we all got scared, realizing it wasn't any known animal. It was moving so fast that I thought if I missed, or if my first shot didn't stop it, I wouldn't get a second shot. Shotguns are only effective within certain distances, and I didn't want it getting too close to me. As we were running away, my friend at the time fell into a groundhog hole, so I had to run back and help him up so we could get to the cars. Given how fast it was running, I don't think it was really trying to catch us, or it would have. When we got to the cars and took off, I recall looking out the side window, and this thing was chasing the cars. Once we got over the little bridge on Anthony onto Manning Road, we were able to get up more speed. I don't think it ever came out of the field or crossed the bridge, though. It was as if it just wanted to chase us off. It never stood up on two legs, and I didn't notice any eye shine. I think it may have been too far away when it started its charge to see the eyes. I can tell you that it was bigger than any dog and much, much faster. It was able to zigzag really fast, like a rabbit. It was very jerky in its side-to-side -side movement, almost twitchy, I'd say. I got the feeling that it was so quick and agile that I might not be able to get a bead on it to get good hits on it with the shotgun. When we were pulling away in the car is probably when I got the best look at it. It had odd body mechanics as it ran. It reminded me of a cheetah, and I could tell the forelimbs were longer than the hind limbs. I couldn't see a tail or the shape of the ears, however. Relevant background info, I have always loved to dance. When I was nine we moved into a bungalow, my new bedroom had a big, wide window that took up roughly half of the wall, and for some reason I didn't have any curtains. But weird in hindsight, but it suited me just fine because at night this window would serve as the perfect mirror for me to watch myself dance, and I would just pretend I was in my own studio. The window faced into the backyard, which was loosely fenced, shitty old fence that provided little privacy, but single mom who worked a lot and barely getting by as it is equals replacing fence not major priority. One summer, I had just got back from visiting family in Europe. I was 12. My mom and brother had also been on the trip, but had returned home about a month earlier. I go in my room and notice that my mom has hung curtains. It struck me as odd even then because my mom was not the type to spontaneously do nice things for me, but I just assumed she had missed me and wanted to make my room cozier for when I got back something. I forgot about it, until about a week later, when I bring up the curtains. Before my mom can say anything, my younger brother goes, you haven't told her? Told me what? Well, apparently while I was away my mom and brother were just hanging out in the living room, which is beside the front door, one night when suddenly my dog started barking like there was someone at the door. It was past midnight, so my mom was understandably freaked out, especially being there alone with a 10 year old. Anyway, there is no knock at the door but my dog is still losing it, so they turn out the lights to try and see if there's something outside. They see two people walking around the front yard with flashlights, turning the corner into the backyard. So, my mom opens the door just wide enough to let the dog out to investigate. Someone starts yelling to get the damn dog under control, and they realize it's two police officers. My mom gets the dog under control and asks them what's going on. They tell her that they are responding to a call reporting a man seen sitting in a tree on the southwest corner of our backyard, staring into a window. 
You can probably guess which window. Anyway, I didn't sleep in my room for a month after that, and couldn't think about it without feeling on the verge of a panic attack for years. Since then, I am always very, very vocal about people having curtains. You may not suspect it, but you never know who could be watching you from the dark. So because of work I had to move out to Kern County in Southern California. Aside from hot weather patterns and dryness here and there it's generally pretty nice. The house I ended up selecting was out in the pines since the housing costs were cheaper up here. However, I would have been better off spending more on something closer to town. I'm convinced that there is something living up here that is somewhat intelligent. About two weeks after moving and I started having trouble sleeping. I would toss and turn and have horrible nightmares that I would only vaguely remember when I woke up. One night it was particularly bad. I woke up shaking and sweating like a pig so I decided to wander into the living room and sit up a few minutes. I was still half asleep and a little delirious but it seemed to me that the room was darker than usual. So I sat down and turned on my TV. About that time I heard something heavy bolt across my porch like a man running at full speed. I looked out the window and realized that I could see the moon, when before I could not. Whatever it was had been standing there right in front of the window blocking the moonlight. Over the next few days things were relatively stable except for a few oddities. Things would move from where I had placed them, but not drastically. On one occasion I found the remains of a dead coyote in my yard, though I'm not entirely positive that it's related. Overall I wasn't too worried about whatever was causing this because obviously it hadn't done anything to hurt me, so why would I have to worry? Except the events that happened last night have spurred me to post this story and seek some possible solution to this little issue. I arrived home late last night after spending time performing maintenance on the company server. When I pulled up into the yard it was deathly quiet, no crickets or anything. I had this feeling like I was being watched. While I can't explain the exact feeling I had with 100% accuracy, I can say it felt like what you would expect to be facing something that wanted to harm you, like a wild animal or something. The problem was I didn't hear or see anything. It was a real physiological sensation that was not quick to leave. I forced myself to sleep that night but the dreams came back causing me to toss and turn. There was no way that I was going to walk back into the living room last night either in the event that whatever it was I saw before is back, watching from outside. I do not look forward to going home tonight. Part 2. I'm writing this update from an internet cafe as I've discovered that I have lost power to my house. It's purely coincidental of course and in no way linked to my current situation. I called up the power company and was assured that someone would be up to take a look at it in the morning. After leaving work today I took a short drive through the mountains to steady my nerves. It worked but only in part. The forested valleys and rivers are beautiful, even the deserts hold their own. I was starting to feel alive again, but I couldn't shake the subtle feeling of dread knowing that I would have to spend another night. Well anyways I started home and arrived at the two-lane road which ascends into the forested area above where my residence is. There are a few sporadic houses on the way up including my closest neighbor's house where I happened to notice a police car and ambulance parked. The subtle dread and apprehension started to make itself more apparent as I passed by. I arrived home and the wind had picked up substantially. It was rustling through the trees and leaves making it difficult to discern any movement from anything non-elemental. I walked up toward my porch and smacked this pine cone comes flinging into the side of my house. I nearly pass out from the surprise but then hey, it's windy. So, I walk in, flip my switch, and nothing. No power. Great I think. There is no way in hell that I'm going to spend the night here without power. I remember reading this article once on the theory of genetic memory and its possible link with phobias. It's the only thing I can think of that would explain the feeling that came next. I heard something moving quickly something that definitely could not be elemental. The hair on the back of my neck stood up, and my body became stiff to the point where it was difficult to raise my arms. I could sense something behind me, 
outside my door and in my yard somewhere. I didn't want to turn around at all. I just wanted to be as far away from that moment as possible. I just stood there for what felt like an eternity, but was most likely only one or two seconds, listening. Leaves rustling, twigs and branches blowing against each other. I forced myself to turn around expecting to see some hideous creature standing there smiling at me. It would have been more comforting than just turning around and seeing nothing, which is exactly what I saw. It was like a cruel joke. I made a dash back to my car, jumped in, slammed the door and locked it. Against my better judgment I decided to drive by my neighbor's house to make sure everything was alright after having seen the ambulance and police there earlier. At least I would be near other people. My neighbor's wife met me at the door and looked distraught. After some conversation she explained that she walked into the house and discovered her husband laying on the ground knocked out. After the paramedics arrived and he came too, he explained what he remembered. He came home and found that the back door of his house was off its hinges, like someone forced their way in with a crowbar or something. After investigating he walked in and felt this buzzing in his head and wave of nausea. After that he remembered getting hit in the head with something and then nothing. Of course considering current events this unsettled me greatly. So now I find myself sitting in this internet cafe pondering my next move. Staying at my granddad's farm in Cornwall UK, picture big fields, long narrow lanes of thick trees and bushes. All right next to massive Clifford by the sea. Just finished watching The Hound of the Baskervilles The Sherlock episode, about a massive black dog that kills people. So I finish watching it about 11pm in my granddad's farmhouse then I have to walk about 1 km to the cottage I'm actually sleeping in. As I'm walking down the long lane with my flashlight, start thinking if there's any place where an animal like that could exist, it's probably somewhere like here where it's so remote. Look up and see it's a full moon then as I look back down I see two red dots in the distance rushing towards me. Two eyes. Can tell it's some animal and the eyes are like a meter off the ground so I know it's no small farm cat or something. Lost my shit and just froze. So it got to me and turns out that a family friend was visiting who has a massive bull, very large dog. Dog was a gentle giant, thankfully because I was frozen to the spot. In an undetermined year, my stepdad resided in Virginia when he was approximately 8 years old, right on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp. According to his account, one night, when the sky was either cloudless or exceptionally bright, he hadn't considered the moon's presence until recently, he encountered a peculiar sight. Looking out of his window, he saw a creature that was staring directly at him. He described it as having spittle running down its face, with eyes locked onto his. This creature was purportedly standing on its hind legs, covered in matted fur of cream, red, and brown hues. Its facial features were notably human-like, except for its snout. It had high jawbones, a structure around its eyes, and eyes themselves that bore a striking resemblance to a human. He believed the creature's eye color to be yellow. What makes this account intriguing and potentially credible is the vast expanse of the Great Dismal Swamp, a region that has remained largely untouched by humans. In recent years, researchers have begun studying the swamp's inhabitants. The swamp's environment is characterized by wet, mossy grounds that effectively absorb sound. People have been known to wander into it and vanish without a trace. The mystery of what might be concealed in this uncharted territory sends a chill down my spine. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that, that night, he crawled out of his bed and sought refuge in his mother's room. In the morning, when they inspected the house, they discovered that the ground under all the windows had been disturbed, and the grass showed signs of being trampled. There were even visible scratches on the wood beneath his window, and paint was missing. Strangely, there were no discernible footprints to explain these unusual occurrences. I was lying across my bed, wide awake when I heard a low, deep growl from just outside my window. 
I called out to my mom, Jen, who was in the living room. She informed me via a VoIP app that she had heard the growl as well. While we were talking, I heard a second growl from outside my room, and it was loud enough for me to hear it even in the living room where my mom was speaking. We decided to move to the same room, the living room, for the rest of the night to ensure our safety. I took a trip up to my sister's place on Roan Mountain in 1989 with my wife. After the first few days of running around and seeing the sights, we spent the day just hanging out at the house. This led to a few cold beverages being consumed and the grill getting fired up that evening. Later that night, around 9 p.m., I went out on the back porch to get another beer. That's when I noticed about half a dozen deer about 100 yards out in the field behind the house. One had a nice rack, and I couldn't quite make out the number of points, so I slipped off the porch and eased over to the corner of the fence, which put me about 60 to 70 yards away from them. As I stood there against the fence, watching the deer, that's when I noticed the moon. When I say I noticed it, I mean I noticed that it was huge and seemed much closer than I'd ever seen it before. I stood there at this fence, watching the deer, or was supposed to be, but I couldn't take my eyes off this big, glowing, yellowish-orange ball of light that seemed to be just out of reach. So, after what I thought was about 20 minutes later, I found out it was more than an hour, I started noticing a tickling sensation on the back of my neck. I shrugged my shoulders and turned my neck a couple of times to shake loose whatever was tickling me, and just then the deer got spooked and bounced away. The noise finally forced me to break my gaze on the moon. That's when I realized that I'd probably been out there long enough. I decided to go back inside. I took one last look and mumbled a wow at the beauty of this little sun reflecting satellite that orbits our world, and that's when it hit me. I felt the hot breath of a huge creature hit the back of my neck at the same time hearing or feeling the deepest chest rumbling I'd ever heard. I spied onto my right, looking over my shoulder. All I could see was black as far as my peripheral vision would allow. It was a Bigfoot. This all happened in a split second. When I got my head around far enough, I realized that my face was maybe 8 to 10 inches away from this thing's upper abdomen. Looking up, I saw this beast's pectoral muscles stick off its chest about 6 inches, and they were huge. Its chest was every bit 4 and a half feet wide, its shoulders were as big as basketballs, adding another foot or so on each side from shoulder to shoulder. This thing was at least 6 feet wide. I didn't get a good look at its hands or face, but its arms were probably more impressive than its chest and shoulders. Its arms were covered in long dark hair, maybe 4 or 6 inches in length. If I had to guess, this behemoth must have been around 10 feet tall and 7 to 800 pounds. As far as its face went, from the angle I was at, all I could make out was a squared off bearded chin. I couldn't see a nose, eyes, ears, a raised brow ridge, a conical head, nothing. So I couldn't say whether it looked more like a man or an ape. Its arms were more like an ape's, but its chest was more human-like, just a little hairier than most. Now this is where the story starts getting weird. As I mentioned earlier, it all happened in a split second. As I spun around and was in the process of looking up, the creature was going from a bent-over position to standing up straight and taking a step back to my right. As it pulled its left leg over its right, it was like it was slipping through a slit in a green screen. I'm not sure if it was a portal or some sort of interdimensional doorway, all I know is this huge thing vanished within that split second. There was no foul smell associated with this creature. There was a slight musty smell, but it reminded me of the same smell a horse gives off. I was hiking with friends up in this particular canyon almost 20 years ago, maybe more. It was night and I'm sure we were not supposed to be there after dark. We were all just young and dumb kids. It was about an hour or two hike up to this waterfall, but it was dry this particular year. We only had flashlights and lightsabers. Like I said, young and dumb. Cell phones weren't a big thing then. 
We got to the base of the waterfall and we noticed a memorial with shoes tied on. They were fairly small shoes. We got up closer and there was a laminated note with a picture of a boy in his teens, explaining he had fallen and died at that spot. It was from family and how he was dearly missed. It happened exactly one year on that same day. We immediately hiked back down, with no rest, freaking the F out. No picture proof but it happened. Was out hiking in a canyon at around 2.30 am. I could hear coyotes yipping a couple miles away, but wasn't too scared. A power transmission line runs at bottom of the canyon and it makes a crackle sound at night when the moisture is high. I noticed a power company service van working with a cherry picker up on the line, but didn't think it was weird, probably fixing a power issue. As I got closer I noticed the workmen were wearing what looked like motorcycle helmets, that completely covered their face. They had flood lights on and I could see the van was white with no logo. I was about 200 yards away and thought it was strange but kept walking. I glanced over again and all three men stopped working. One had come down off the crane silently and gathered with the others together perfectly still facing my direction. I completely froze. With those helmets on, I couldn't tell what they were looking at but their bodies all faced me and they weren't taking to each other. I could see their helmets were solid white and didn't have reflective shields or anything to look through. At that point I panicked and bolted. I glanced over my shoulder and one was following me but not actually moving, just somehow moved closer and standing still. While running I remember thinking I never actually saw any of them move. That freaked me out and left the trail and ran off road straight to the nearest house. I didn't look back until I was a good half mile away. When I did look, the van was there but the men were gone. I kept running and eventually made it home. I was a high school counselor and years ago I had a conversation with a student that I still think about a lot. Wondering what you all make of it. He was a good kid, not a liar, troublemaker or anything. He wasn't mentally ill. He came into my office one day very excited because he read a library book, can't remember which one, that made him remember some experiences from childhood that he had forgotten until then. He remembered often being in the woods on his ranch in Mexico, and communicating with little people, like fairies or elves, who lived among the flowers and plants. He proceeded to tell me that there were three angels standing behind me. He said the angels knew that I was worried about my, adult, son, and I shouldn't worry, that he was going to be fine. I had been very worried about my son, but there's no way this student would have known. Sure, he could have been crazy or making it up, but the weirdest part is that the second I had a thought in my head, he'd say the angel said you thought such and such. And he was correct every time. The conversation went on for a long time and I can't explain it. He graduated soon after and I've run into him a couple of times but nothing else significant. Thoughts? I was at a Korean community grocery store in September 2015. I went to buy some items and as I was approaching the counter to pay, I noticed this twitchy small woman, young in her mid-twenties I'm guessing, but she looked like she was in the DTs in need of a fix. It's a shame really. I thought she would have been pretty if all cleaned up. Well, I still thought she was pretty. She was asking for matches but she had no money. I made my payment and asked for matches for the lady and it was just then at the corner of my eye I saw a darker than dark mass just behind her but taller. I turned my head and looked directly at it. It was moving like iron filings that would shift as you moved a magnet, but not unlike an insect. Its eyes were bright like diamond white and angular like a diamond but on the sides. Its head was also pointed and the head and back were not unlike a planarian worm. The weird thing as I looked down I saw the lady's arms and legs were wrapped from behind and underneath her appendages and the thing's body was pressed so close like a piece of clothing or blanket. That's when it moved like an insert with like a twitch, when it moved so did the lady. Then as I look at its face just above her head like someone peering over someone, just not fully. 
It turned and looked directly at me. I have to tell you I knew enough from experience that you do not show fear and remain calm when all you want to do is scream and point and run, which I really wanted to do. I acted like I was looking through it and looked around not caring that I was just seen and almost ran. The clerk handed her the matches and she thanked me then I left. As I left I was looking straight ahead but internally I was concentrating behind me wondering if it was still looking at me. All this time happened in under a minute. I began wondering what I had seen and drew it once I got home. I showed my siblings a few days later and told them what happened. They claimed it could be a possession or a djinn. I'm still not sure. But know this, I look at people now differently who are on drugs or under the influence. How they move or walk is exactly like how this creature moves. What if that is true, and part of the reason why they can't stop? You know if you watch zombie movies like Walking Dead. They kinda move like that too. It's just a weird way they walk, and shuffle. I haven't seen anything like this before, nor since. Maybe you or your reader might know what the heck I saw? This occurred in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Best regards. I was a sailor in the US Navy for four years, during my time out at sea I had seen some interesting things. First, I was an aviation ordnanceman on a gun mount in the Arabian Gulf. There were two instances of two separate things that had happened. First off, which at the end doesn't end up too creepy, but I thought I'd share it anyways. While on gun mount watch from balls to four we were watching into the sea to see several streaks of water coming towards the ship. Like these streaks reminded me of when you see torpedoes in the movies and the streaks in the water that they leave behind. Seen these through night vision goggles. Turns out they were whales. The second is pretty bizarre. So when on your balls to four watch you have to even look in the air for possible air assaults, as we are looking at the sky there seems to be a satellite or something similar looking like it was orbiting the earth. The fantail gun mount says mount 51 do you see that object in the sky, looks like it's right above us. I seen it, and confirmed to the other mount that I had seen it. They told us to watch that object, about 3 minutes of watching this object it speeds up and heads towards the bow of the ship, immediately changes direction and shoots towards the fantail and disappears within 10 seconds. All the gun mounts were calling into the bridge about this object, freaked us out. This was maybe August of 2011. Hi everyone. Gonna start by saying I generally don't believe in the paranormal or ghosts etc. But I have been working in this school for just over a year now and my perspective is beginning to get changed. I don't know if this is the right place to tell this in, if it is not please guide me to the correct one. I think I'll start by just explaining the school. It's based in London and is a very old school that has been here for almost 100 years. The school is massive, three floors and loads of classes or rooms etc. So my first experience started with something completely small or insignificant but made me think more. I am a PE teacher in the school and I was in the school for a holiday club. This means there was nobody in the school other than me and my team and the children we were working with. The children are not allowed upstairs or anywhere without us. What happened was I was outside coaching and I looked up to the third floor and there was papers in the room fluttering in front of the windows. Now this could obviously be explained by a draft or open window of course. The strange thing is that at this point we had no access to the school top floors and they are locked and alarmed. The alarm will go off if any windows and doors are opened. The main thing that happened to make me think happened two days ago. I was walking upstairs to my office in the second floor, we now have access to all floors, and I heard a person whistling, like full on whistling, this whistling stopped as soon as I came off the stairs and just a reminder there is nobody in the school apart from my team and definitely nobody on the second floor. The next thing is that I left my office and walked to the second floor staff room which is directly across from my office and on that walk I heard a child laugh and giggle. There is absolutely no way any children were on the second floor and no way I heard it was from downstairs. 
There has been other strange occurrences, but this is the first time I've really been unable to debunk it. My dad was on an aircraft carrier during Vietnam and he and his buddies used to go sit against the wheels of the aircraft on deck and waste time at night. He reports there was a really bright light far off in the distance he thought was a star, or planet, but all of a sudden it moved really quickly and hovered off the side of the ship next to them for a few moments. Then it took off and was completely out of sight within a second. He loves to tell the story of his UFO experience. No probes here people, merely a very fast bright ball of light. Edit, now that I saw the post about ball lightning, I'm thinking that may have been it. Having my dad check out the YouTube videos to confirm. Response from my dad, well, I watched the video and it's possible that is what we saw. It came down like a falling star with a tail on it and then stopped about a mile above the ocean got larger and went parallel with our ship for about 5 or 6 seconds. Then, it got small again like it was going straight away from us, turned right and went out of sight in a matter of a few seconds. It was like supersonic speed. This says they are usually associated with thunderstorms. Ours was on a perfectly clear night. However, we were just off of the Philippines and it was super hot and humid. You might have solved the mystery, though. Thanks for the enlightenment. Love you. There are a series of events in my childhood home, mostly at night. I'll name a few. Once, I was going downstairs at around 1 am. Everyone was asleep except me, I woke up for a drink. I went downstairs, opened the fridge, and while I was holding the fridge open, I placed my phone with a flashlight on the table. I felt something grabbing my hand, like an actual touch. I looked while I pulled away, and there was nothing there. I got incredibly scared. I was sure that my brain wasn't playing tricks or anything, I was sure. So, I ran upstairs and left my phone there. Another incident was when I was much younger, also around 1 am. My twin sister and I were up. The door was directly facing the bed, and we were playing on her bed with the lights all out and everyone else asleep. Suddenly, the light goes on, and we see a shadow directly under the door. We thought it was our parents. Then, the light goes out, and we take a slight peek with our tablets in our hands, using the flash. There was nothing there, and we didn't hear any sound of anyone leaving or even in the house. We could also hear sounds downstairs quite a bit at night. Our parents never experienced any of this, and when we asked them about it, they never knew anything about who was downstairs. My sister could hear it too. These are the more major incidents. We don't have any signs of them anymore, but I also had quite a few nightmares. This happened about an hour ago. My family was in the car since we came back from a restaurant but a couple of hours before, my dad and two brothers were in London, exploring. We came across a man who was doing some tricks with a ball and three cups. If you were able to find out which cup had the ball inside, you would win the money. In the car, I asked my dad how did he think the trick was done and he honestly didn't know and was struggling to explain how the man could have done it. I told my dad how I thought the man did it and as I did, I saw my mom in the rear view mirror smiling but the smile wasn't ordinary. It was sort of sinister. I didn't think much of it and went back to using my phone. After a minute, I looked back at the rear view mirror and realized something. How could I have seen my mom in the rear view mirror if she was sitting in the passenger seat? I could only be able to see my dad who was driving in front of me and my brother who was behind me. The car is a seven-seater. I asked my mom if she was smiling at me and she said she hadn't even looked up from her phone on a while. I told her that she did and she denied it. I believed her because there was no way I would have been able to see her unless she was driving or sitting behind me. What the hell was that smiling at me? I wouldn't call it creepy, more like fascinating to watch. Once, while tied up for a hurricane, I watched the storm surge coming in. 
It took a few hours before the storm was on top of us and all the while there was wildlife scurrying around in a panic in the woods where we were tied off. The deer probably got out the earliest, there were sightings of rabbits, raccoons, squirrels and other wildlife you would expect to see on the Gulf Coast, but they didn't stick around long. The ones that stuck around, began spending their time swimming. So basically I was on a boat surrounded by muskrats playing in the rain and they seemed to be having fun until the strongest wind started coming in. By that time all the lines we were using for moorings were beginning to go underwater from the surge. The hurricane came in, did its thing then passed and the winds and rain started calming down. That's when I saw the things I would describe as fascinating. Boils of snakes floating around us, literally thousands of them. Some of those boils would come alongside our boat and the crew members were quick to push them off when they started trying to climb up. Most of them were garter snakes but who wants to take a chance with them right? I saw piles of alligators floating by on driftwood, some trapped alongside us just sitting there patiently waiting on the water to recede. So many frogs, I would guess beyond many thousands that were picked up by the wind were on board. We were moving a 900 foot tow and there were so many frogs you couldn't see the upwind side of it because so many frogs were clinging to it. I was still catching and releasing rogue frogs from the bilge months later. When the muskrats returned from wherever they were hiding, they seemed to want to take a shot at getting on board too. Some managed too. Needless to say we made it a point to keep all outside doors closed for a few days unless we absolutely needed to open one. I work on an oil exploration ship all around the world. I often go out onto the helideck at night to watch the stars and generally escape form the fact that I've pretty much been in prison for the last several weeks. One night in particular stands out to me. We were working in the North Sea about 200 miles offshore Norway. A heavy fog enveloped the vessel with the deck lights creating an orb of light only a few meters in diameter. When I stepped out onto the helideck, I noticed a strange sound all around the vessel. I stood silently and waited for my eyes to adjust to the darkness. The orb of light spread as my eyes adjusted and I soon saw what was making the racket. Tens of thousands of sparrows were circling the vessel. A constant stream of them flowed past the lights. I stood there for about 30 minutes in complete disbelief at how surreal it was. Also, I was incredibly thankful it wasn't the shrieking eels. Oregon coast about 3 miles out from Tillamook Bay. I was on a huge sailboat with some friends when out of nowhere a smell came like you have never smelled. A thousand farting satans could not have produced such a horrible smell. No matter where we went this dense rotting fish smell saturated the air. Well after a few hours of this we had enough and turned sails to head in. Well not 400 yards due east of our heading was something large bobbing in the water. Turns out someone cast a fishing net into the ocean and wrapped up a large barrel in either a whale calf or a walrus. It was horrible, I can still taste it today. We were transiting the Straits of Hormuz at night probably 1971 and suddenly held a radar contact close and dead ahead. Its position relative to us was steady bearing, decreasing range as if a vessel was going to collide with our destroyer. The Oud and the rest of the bridge watch saw no lights or any evidence of an approaching vessel. Minutes go by, tension mounts, the captain is called to the bridge, the radar contact gets closer and closer until it disappears at the center of our radar scope. No collision. There was no vessel as it turns out. In checking later, the navigation chart showed a high overhead cable that was reflecting and returning our radar beam. Not me, but my father back in his commercial fishing days noticed that there was a t-shirt in the middle of his net after one tow. After a little investigation he found that it was not a shirt, but a human torso wearing a shirt. He said he was terrified that he would open the net and a head would roll out onto his feet, but it didn't happen. 
His captain radioed ahead and they brought the torso back to the docks, where they were met by the police and a coroner. They were eventually able to identify the body, based on the clothing, as a victim of a plane crash that had occurred fairly recently. My dad said he offered a free lobster to the coroner, who graciously accepted it until he found out that it had been found in the net with the body. After that he got angry and told him to throw it back. I had an old teacher in high school that used to be in the Navy. He told us stories about how he had to repair the things at the top of the pole that sticks straight out from the center of the ship. Yes, my naval terminology is crap. Think it was related to a satellite, or just a light bulb, or something. Anyways, he says that when you're so high up, and the ocean is tilting the boat from side to side, you're basically above the water, instead of above the deck of the boat. If you were to fall off at that moment, you'd land directly into the black ocean. He said there were times when he had to climb up to talk down one of the new guys who couldn't climb down. I am in the Navy and, at the time of this anecdote, I was part of a security detachment for a freighter off the coast of Iran. It was a few hours into my watch, probably around one on a gun mount, when a small fishing vessel near the horizon starts beaming our ship with a high-powered laser pointer. This is actually a pretty common occurrence in the area, but I reported to my superior to make sure they were aware. About two or three minutes later, I look back over to where the vessel was to check on it and it's gone. It was the middle of the night in the ocean, but my naked eye should have picked up the boat with relative ease. I put on my night vision goggles and scan the same area forward of the ship. Nothing. Literally, nothing. No vessel, no stars, no horizon, just nothing. I felt like I was tired, perhaps my night watch was getting to my head. I took off the goggles and did some jumping jacks and push-ups for a few minutes and took another look. That's when I saw it, an impending wall of grey, no start, no beginning, just grey. Fog. Heavy, thick fog, thicker than any fog I've ever seen. Within moments every metal surface was coated in mist, I could not see more than 20 or so feet in any direction. It was eerie, the civilians piloting the ship didn't use any horns or anything, we just sailed through the dense cloud. I couldn't even see the water, my only perception of speed was the thick mist moving past me. Luckily, nothing happened, but when you are standing an armed watch on a big freighter near Iran, in waters that have had reports of pirates, and your most important sense is taken away from you. I couldn't help but imagine what could happen as we move through that dense fog for, what seemed like, 20 minutes. Story time. My name is Captain Daniel Harris, and my years of service in Special Forces Unit have led me into countless harrowing situations. Still, nothing could have prepared me for the chilling mission beneath the abandoned Teufelsberg radar station in Berlin. On the surface, our objective seemed straightforward. Locate the hidden Cold War era bunker rumored to contain classified secrets capable of reshaping modern geopolitics. The mission's shroud of secrecy and aura of historical enigma fueled our anticipation. Our elite team, well versed in urban exploration, moved with calculated precision as we descended into the depths of the decaying radar station. The air was heavy with the acrid scent of dampness and decay, and our footsteps reverberated through the dimly lit corridors. Our headlamps cast eerie, flickering shadows on the graffiti-laden walls, remnants of the station's past. We finally reached a substantial steel door, cleverly concealed behind a faux wall, which led into a sprawling underground complex. It was here, in the heart of this clandestine subterranean world, that we confronted a chilling enigma. As we entered a spacious chamber, we were confronted by a creature that defied all explanation. Standing at an imposing height of nearly eight feet, it possessed the torso of a man, yet its limbs and head were reminiscent of a massive wolf or dog. Its fur was a tangled mass of dark, ashen gray, and its eyes emitted an unsettling, malevolent glow. 
Before we could react, the creature sprang upon us with astounding speed and ferocity. In the ensuing pandemonium, two of my comrades succumbed to the beast's savage claws, their agonized cries resonating through the underground chamber. The rest of us fought desperately to shield our fallen comrades and repel the assailant. After what seemed like an eternity, the creature withdrew, having seemingly completed its mission to protect the hidden bunker. It darted into the labyrinthine passageways, disappearing into the depths, leaving behind a scene of unspeakable horror and sorrow. We regrouped, our faces reflecting the shock and confusion that the unfathomable encounter had inflicted upon us. Despite our unnerving experience, our orders remained resolute, find the bunker and unveil its long-guarded secrets. Though haunted by the memory of the dogman and the comrades we had lost, we proceeded with our mission. Upon reaching the heart of the bunker, we uncovered a trove of classified documents and artifacts from the Cold War era. The treasure trove contained intelligence and technology capable of reshaping the geopolitical landscape. Our mission was an unequivocal success. Reluctantly, we made contact with our general, relaying the inconceivable encounter with this dogman type of thing. His response was fraught with skepticism, urging us to focus on the task at hand and leave the tales of monsters to folklore. Despite the doubts of our superiors, we knew the veracity of our experience beneath Teufelsberg. We resolved to resume our search for the enigmatic creature, driven by a determination to unearth the truth regarding its origins and purpose. Whether the Dogman was a product of Cold War experimentation or a more sinister force, our encounter continued to haunt our thoughts as we ventured further into the shadowy depths of the concealed bunker. It was a typical day in my Alaskan research lab when the unexpected happened. I was engrossed in my work, examining data on climate change's impact on local wildlife, when the door swung open. Startled, I looked up to find myself face to face with a team of special forces, their uniforms marked with the unmistakable insignia of the Navy SEALs. I couldn't help but crack a skeptical smile. Can I help you gentlemen with something? I asked, thinking it was a joke or some strange government experiment. The leader of the team, a weathered and stoic figure, met my gaze dead on. Dr. Parker, have you ever heard of a creature known as the Yeti or Bigfoot? I burst into laughter, thinking they were playing a prank on me. Bigfoot? Seriously? Are you guys here to investigate an urban legend? But their expressions remained unyielding, serious. We're not here to joke around, Dr. Parker. The government sent us here to find a creature, something similar to a Yeti, that's been spotted roaming the Alaskan wilderness. We need your expertise. I shrugged, not taking it seriously. I've been studying Alaskan wildlife for years, and I've never seen any evidence of such a creature. It's just folklore, myths, and exaggerations. The team didn't argue further. They nodded, leaving my lab to embark on their quest. My curiosity got the best of me, and I couldn't resist trailing them from a distance as they ventured into the harsh Alaskan wilderness. It was during one frigid evening, as I watched them from behind the cover of snow-laden pines, that I witnessed something inexplicable. The forest grew eerily silent, and a shiver ran down my spine. The seals moved with a grace that defied their bulk, and then, there it was, emerging from the shadows. The creature was immense, towering at least eight feet tall. Its fur was a mottled blend of white and gray, matted and thick, clearly built to withstand the brutal Alaskan winters. Its eyes were hauntingly human, filled with a mix of curiosity and fear as it confronted the intruders in its territory. The beast's face was a blend of human and ape-like features, a fusion of the known and the unknown. Muscles rippled beneath its fur as it let out a guttural roar, echoing through the forest. This was no ordinary animal. It was something inexplicable, something beyond science and understanding. The Yeti, the Bigfoot, or whatever you wanted to call it, was very real. As the special forces engaged in a tense standoff with the creature, I couldn't help but marvel at the unexplainable phenomenon that had unfolded before my eyes. Yet, 
My awe was short-lived as I began to feel that some of the special forces had noticed my presence, my intrusion. With a heart pounding like a drum, I retreated into the safety of my lab, locked the door, and watched from the window as the confrontation outside intensified. The creature ultimately retreated into the dense wilderness, but the seals were determined to continue their hunt. I can't explain the events of that day, but I swear by the truth of what I saw. There, in the depths of the Alaskan wilderness, a cryptid, a being that defied scientific understanding, had become a reality. Whether it was a Yeti, a Bigfoot, or something else entirely, it was an experience that forever changed my perspective on the mysteries of the natural world and the secrets it still holds. I was a Baltimore Police Department detective and, at the time, in early 2021, I worked directly out of the Northern District in the city. On the night in question, I was in my office at home late at night in suburban Howard County, Maryland. I live alone. I often would find myself unable to sleep at night, so I would head to my office to work. That particular night I was going through a case file that I was working on. Then I heard an unusual noise. It was just different enough from anything I was used to hearing around the house that it caught my attention, not to mention it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. It sounded like something heavy was hitting the ground. It was coming from the yard behind the house. I stood up and I cocked my head to the side to try and pinpoint the exact location. But as I listened closer I realized that it sounded like it might actually be much closer to the house, like right outside the kitchen in the back. I stepped away from my desk and I moved towards my office door. My office was just down the hall from the kitchen. So I opened the door slowly and stepped out to investigate, but first I listened again to be sure I was correct on the direction it was coming from. Sure enough, I heard it again from the area outside the kitchen. I started to make my way down the hallway and as I got closer the noise got louder. I reached the kitchen and I looked toward the door. The noise had gone silent, almost like whatever was making the noise knew I was listening to it. I slowly and very quietly opened the door to the outside. When I did I was shocked at what I was looking at. Standing on the patio, moving around and making the noise, was a creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was about 7 feet tall and totally covered in black and reddish brown fur. It had a long snout with teeth protruding at odd angles. The creature turned towards me when the door opened, almost like it instinctively knew I was there. I was totally quiet when I opened the door. The creature quickly focused on me and lunged toward me hissing. I quickly stepped back inside and shut the door. I had to think fast and determine a suitable plan of action. I decided to head back to my office where I hoped to watch it undetected from my office window. I proceeded to look through the window but it wasn't long before I heard the sounds of the creature breaking into the house through the kitchen door. I pulled out my gun and I aimed it down the hallway. As I slowly opened the office door. I could hear, but not see, the creature in the kitchen. I listened as it was moving around with a lot of force and stepping heavily on the wood floor. I could also hear it snorting as it moved about. It sounded like something out of a horror film. I thought that if I just stayed quiet it might just leave, which would have been the optimal outcome. I listened to it for a while while it moved in the kitchen, but then I heard it go into the dining room. I could hear glass breaking and furniture being shoved around. It seemed to be very angry. I finally opened my office door all the way and stepped out completely into the hallway. I slowly walked towards the dining room with my gun still raised. As soon as I got close I peeked my head around the corner. It turned its head towards me and instantly started to growl. It had an angry look on its face, with a human-like expression. I sensed that it wanted to tear me apart right there. But instead of rushing and attacking me, it suddenly went silent again. It quickly rushed back to the kitchen and hurled itself out through the back door. I didn't know what to think at that point. On one hand, I was relieved that it had left, but at the same time, I somehow felt concerned that it may return at some point. I decided then and there that I would find out more about this creature. My confusion and fear turned into anger. 
I wanted to know who or what this thing was and why it had come into my house. I've done a lot of research, mainly online. But it's been difficult to find anything that really matched what happened. I wondered why it came into the house and what it was looking for. The other descriptions online were generally similar. It was bipedal, with pointed ears, large yellow tinged eyes, and canine-like teeth. It also had a very pungent sulfur-like odor that I can still smell in my memory. My research led to your blog, am I contacting you? I have many questions and would like to talk. I still live in the same house, but I currently work for another local law enforcement department. I have not seen the creature since that night, but I instinctively know that it still roams in my area. I wish to remain completely anonymous and discreet about my encounter. I am an avid hunter. My name is Bo, and I have hunted and fished all my life. I joined the army straight out of high school, and now I work six days a week. But enough about me, y'all want to know what true nightmares are made out of. I have found out last October hunting a new river. I had gotten up early that morning and cooked breakfast for my fiancé. My fiancé loves fried eggs in the morning, and I do them exactly like she likes. So we eat, and I get my camel out of the bag as well as my rifle out of the cabinet. We headed out that morning, and I took my fiancé to work. Her work was on the way to New River. When we pull in, I give her a kiss, and she tells me to bring her home something good. I told her I would, and I got back in my jacked-up Chevy 2500. The trip to the mountain was as gorgeous as always, and the Tennessee back roads are amazing and beautiful. So I got to my spot, but it was so eerily quiet that morning. Around noon, I decided to go to the truck and grab a sandwich and another bottle of water. So I eat a peanut butter and syrup sandwich my fiancé made me while I was getting ready. She even had time to write me a note, and basically said she loved me and was happy that we were together, since it was only one month out from having our little girl, and she was just an amazing old lady. After I got done, I decided to walk to the tree stand again. On my walk back in the woods, I start to have this feeling of dread that something is wrong, that something just isn't right. But I brush it off, thinking maybe it's just nerves since this is hog country after all, and I've been chased on the road before that I'm walking on. But this just kept getting worse and worse. I started getting deeper down the ridge, closer to my stand, and I hear a twig break, and I stop. Now, me being an experienced hunter, I notice movement in this thicket just about 50 or so yards away. I notice this brown shape moving out towards me. So I crouch down, ready my rifle, and I train my rifle on the color. When I get to noticing that this thing is grunting, so I'm thinking yes, a big buck. God, was I wrong? The thing slowly walked out closer and closer, and I realized that wow, this creature is so massive, it's way bigger than a deer on all fours. So I'm thinking, okay, an elk is walking out, cool. But I noticed its head and the shape is all wrong. It slowly starts walking out, and all of a sudden it stops and stands up. I mean on two legs, it's easily eight feet tall. But because I'm 6'6", six six, the thicket is just above my head, and this thing's almost a foot to two feet above it. It starts sniffing the air, and its head snaps right to my direction. I freeze up at that moment, feeling like I'm concreted to the ground. The wolf thing that I was looking at was beginning to let out this real deep, almost demonic-like growl. It starts snarling, showing its teeth towards me. I, being army trained, realize if it charges, I'm only getting one shot at this thing, so I'd have to make it count. All of a sudden, it begins to tear through the bushes on all fours again. I realize the movie Van Halen's werewolf is charging at me at full speed. I realized I'm in big trouble, and I hear this branch break behind me. I look over my shoulder and see that there is a second larger wolf behind me on two legs. It is easily nine feet tall, built like a bodybuilder, with jet black fur. It drops to all fours and starts running full speed towards me, but this one was a lot closer. 
I spin around and see that this thing is too fast for me to unsafely shoot it with my rifle. I jump out of the way of this monstrous beast charging me. I end up hitting the hard rocks and slid into the red clay mud, just to realize it already crossed the roadbed I'd been walking on, and the Thule wolves are set on a collision course. When the bigger black wolf hits the lighter brown wolf, he tackles the brown wolf to the ground, as they are rolling down the hill, clawing and biting and slamming each other into the hard ground. The smaller brown wolf kicks and paws from the bottom when its back claws rip the big black wolf's stomach wide open and throws him off onto the ground. The brown wolf then turns to me, it snarls, and starts charging again at full speed. I am awestruck by the power of the wolf and the sheer size of it as it's on its way towards me. But the big black wolf slams the brown one from behind, running its arm through the brown one's side, picking it up and clamps its massive jaws on a shoulder as it throws the brown one down away from me. It lands and rolls about 10 yards and jumps up, running away back through the brush. I let out the breath I didn't even realize I was holding in at that moment. I look at the now bloody and beaten, ripped open black wolf, which is standing with blood dripping off its back claws and glistening white teeth, dripping with the blood of the brown wolf. And for some reason, it registers to me that I have to show that I am no threat to the king of the mountain. I lower the rifle down away from me, and as I do this, this thing smirks at me, lets out an ear-shattering roar that turns into a howl as it looks into my soul. I see the eyes of a beast, and I can understand that it was there to show it was the alpha, and as long as I showed him respect, he will not be a threat. It turned to drop on all fours and ran away after the other. I instantly take off running, luckily for me and the army had allowed for me to stay in great shape. I take off of the ridge and make it to the truck. As soon as I get to the door, I realize there's blood all over the side of my truck. I hesitate to look, but I had to know. I flip the rifle safety off, ready to blast anything that jumps up from the bed of the truck. I realize there is a big dead doe laying in the bed of my truck that has had its neck broken. I jump in, start the truck, spin it around, throwing gravel into rooster, I'm tearing us out of the woods, and I fly all the way down the mountain through the back roads and don't stop until I reach in Mur. My fiancé can tell I'm shaken up, so she ends up taking me home. I tell her everything, but we decide to tell everyone that I hit the dough with my truck and I got spooked by it because who would believe me, right? That is until I got to hearing other people who have seen this massive animal as well. So I thought that this would be the best way for me to get this story off my chest and not get told I'm crazy or lying or making it up. I just wanted to warn every hunter and hiker around that we ain't the top of the food chain or the king of the mountain because the king of the mountain is a truly massive beast who has no predators. Thanks again for helping me get this story off my chest. Now let me tell you about my second encounter. I have the Bigfoot encounter where me and my fiancé had seen that same wolf man. We have been going hunting in New River again. We have seen a family of Bigfoot for three or four years now. They have never been aggressive or anything like that. They show respect and are generally curious creatures. There are four Bigfoot in the area. The big male is jet black and about 9 to 10 foot tall. He looks like a jacked hair man. The second largest is a female about 8 foot tall, a light brown color with black stripes down her shoulders and back. The two smaller ones are between 6 and 8 foot tall, both lighter brown. There is one male and one female juvenile. The young male is a dark brown with a light brown patch on his chest. The young female is a light golden brown and absolutely gorgeous in color. We usually see them all together as a family unit or the two males going out together. It looks as if they have both been on the deer trails or the gravel and dirt roads too across the area. They are all very curious. They have been known to walk up close, within 50 yards or so, whooping and chirping. Me and my fiancé we have had a blast seeing them and getting them used to us being in the area. We have built a cabin down in the holler of the ridge. This cabin in the woods is set next to a gorgeous place set between creeks branches, but in a way that we can get a vehicle to the door. We started first seeing the male, 
and that was nervous because it isn't too far from where I had seen the two dog men fighting originally. Shortly after, we got to seeing the full family. They'd check out the truck or look in the windows at night to see if we were cooking there. For a while, my fiancé was scared of them, and then she realized that they were just curious. It has been amazing to see the young ones playing around in the creek on hot summer days. The big male lying in the cool mud with the big female laid up in the shade, while the two youngsters play, splashing and rolling in mud, and even throwing mud. Once the young male ran up behind me while I was fixing a tree stand that was sitting in the bed of my Chevy 2500. He scared me with the loud steps running up behind me, then he let out a rather strange whoop, almost as if he said, boo, as he said, who. I jumped around, startled, and the young one was standing there, laughing like a little fat feller, who would be holding his stomach, kind of like a backwood Satan style laugh. I laughed at him and said, you little ex. The big male walked up and grunted towards him. He waved and ran away. My fiancé had stepped out on the porch when she had heard the sound and waited to see them some more, since it's been the second time that morning that they'd been around. She seen me and the big male standing only 10 yards away from each other. He dwarfed me. I've seen her face, and it showed she was nervous, if not scared. It was a bit shocking to see him so up close. That happened close enough to smell his musky aroma. Last weekend, I noticed he got a new open wound on his chest. It was four big claws down his burly, leathery chest. We left some fruit that was going bad out for him so he could get to it a bit easier, so he'd heal up because it showed me that he would protect the area. This weekend, we went up again but didn't hear them or see them anywhere. I was honestly kind of worried that something happened to him, and that the family would be in trouble. So I kept looking for them. That Friday night, not seeing them all night long, the next morning my fiancé and I got up and had breakfast. We went hunting up the ridge just a ways and had a wonderful day together. We always have been side by side. Her love of hunting just made her so much more attractive to me. I honestly am the luckiest man in the world to have her as my partner. Saturday evening, we got back down to the camp, and we noticed something had been through the leaves all around the camp. It gave us a bit of hope that they're all okay. We had then gotten ready for supper, started cooking as the sun was setting. In New River, it gets pitch black dark in just a few moments. My fiancé had stepped out to the porch to go grab me a bottle of Jack out of the truck. And I heard the door open on the truck. I heard it slam as she came running through the door. And I dropped everything, and I hurried to make sure that she's okay. And she was standing there saying that she thought our big male neighbor was coming up the creek bed towards us. So we decided to turn the camp stove down so we could step outside to watch him approach. So as we are standing there, I light a cigarette and hand it to my fiancé as I light my own. I realized he is walking kinda weird and not sounding good. His normal strong, crisp sounding grunts are sounding more deep and raspier. I take the bag of fruit out of the back truck, and we walk down closer to the creek bed. We creep back up the creek bank towards camp. As we are, the critter is coming closer to me. Not knowing, I stepped into a hole where one of the young ones had grabbed a clump of mud and thrown it. I hit the ground hard as I was stepping backward, and I stood back up quickly, trying not to spook the Bigfoot with my pain groan. My fiancé turned and helped me back to my feet, but as she turned her back from the animal, my heart sank as I saw the deep pitch black wolf man that had won the fight before with the brown wolf. He starts picking up a pace towards us. And in that moment, I jumped to my feet. I told my fiancé to run, that I'd hold it off as long as I could. Its massive body jumps through the creek still at an incredible speed. So I put myself between the beast and I and my old lady, the love of my life. I couldn't let anything happen to her. So I am putting myself in front, yelling this primal roar I never knew I had from the deepest place of my soul. The wolf man, breaking out of the water on a full sprint towards me as I have gotten his attention. Now. I draw a bowie knife out of this sheath my grandfather had left over from the Vietnam War. At this moment, knowing I'm going to die, 
as he would destroy me, all of a sudden, there is a roar from the top of the hill. Standing proud, the young female was roaring and beating her chest as the wolfman stops. So do I to see the new creature trying to enter the fray. My fiancé stops on a dime, and she was staring at me with tears in her eyes. As I realize that she has the hunting rifle from the bed of the truck, the wolf starts to snarl and growl. He realizes he's in trouble, and he bats me away onto my back. My fiancé takes a shot and shoots him. The shot goes into the chest, but it barely grazes him. As my fiancé comes running up to me and having another gun with her, handing it to me, we realize that the young female and young male standing across the creek had started throwing rocks at the wolfman. I start backing up slowly towards my fiancé, as the big male Bigfoot and the alpha wolfman hit into this devastating brawl. The wolf, clawing and slashing, the big male proudly standing there. He grabbed the wolf by the throat and held him back, as the two youngsters are pelting the wolfman with rocks, the male swinging its massive large arms down on the wolf, and dropping it to its knees. But as that's going on, the wolf slashes the Bigfoot's legs, dropping him to his knees. The Bigfoot and wolfman both being dropped to their knees. And as the Bigfoot hits its knees, it lets out a pained bellow. The wolfman jumps on top of him. Then one of the other Bigfoot swings a down tree and smashes the wolfman right in the head, as it flips backwards, she swings, breaking the log across its stomach. He jumps and runs away. The female making a delicate chirping and clicking as she kneels down to the male, the young ones across the creek to reunite with the two larger family members. My fiancé is running to my side, wrapping me in a hug and holding me saying that she's so proud of me and is just thankful that I'm okay. And we get to tearing down the mountain, every bump reminding me of my bruised ribs. I thanked her for coming back for me, and we get to the main road. She leans over, gives me a kiss, and we get the hell out of Dodge. I am in summer camp and something is throwing people off trees. A little introduction before we begin. My friends and I have been going to summer camp every year. Tom, Jack, Susan and Emily are my friends who have been accompanying me since forever. We are high school students. This time we chose a different camp. It was called Camp Jacob and it's on a small island called Jacob's Isle. We traveled to Jacob's Isle on a ferry. It is about three and a half hour journey from the mainland and the first thing we noticed was that there is no cell reception here. David is the leader of the summer camp and he has a satellite phone for communication with the ferry and mainland. We hiked till the camp. It was a half hour hike. We saw the establishment was amazing. There were two dozen small huts made of wood. The main building was no different. The main building was in the middle of the camp and it comprised of a common room, kitchen, dining room, a storage room and an infirmary. Twelve huts each on either side of the main building. Each hut had two bunk beds and can fit four people. Tom, Jack and I got in hut 7 along with fellow camper Ashwin. Emily and Susan went to hut 21. All four corner huts, 1, 12, 13, 24 were occupied by them. We were to unpack and meet the others in 30 minutes where we shall make a bonfire for the evening. It was a fun experience. We have made friends with Ashwin and we also met the girls sharing the hut with Susan and Emily. They were Lily and Rose. Lily and Rose were cousins. We had dinner and were told that we would go to the sunrise point in the morning and so we have to wake up by 4.30 am as the sunrise is at 5.45 am. It is a half hour hike and it wasn't easy to get up so early. We started the hike at 5 am and were told it was about 10 minutes away but in reality it took twice the time. We were on the east coast of the island. It was a beach of white sand. This was my new favorite place Jack had his camera out to capture the moment when the sun rises. It was a beautiful sight and worth waking up early. We hiked back to the camp through the forest when we heard a growling sound. It was scary. The counselors huddled us and escorted us back to the camp. I could see that they were nervous. We were told to go to the main building for breakfast. 
I saw David and three others went scouting north of the camp. The other counselors were smiling but they were tensed. What do you think that sound was? I asked. It was scary. I don't care what it was and I don't want to know, Susan replied. Only that it should stay away from us, Emily said. Come on Peter. Don't scare the girls, Tom laughed. Yeah. It can be a bird or something. The forest can make it sound scarier, Ashwin said with conviction. I disagree. Something scary is out there. Check this out, Jack gestured us to take a look at his camera. The small LCD screen wasn't so easy to look at but Emily saw what Jack wanted to show. It took a lot of pointing and zooming before I could see the red dots behind the trees. Jack thought they were eyes. I thought they were lens flares or something. This is not a scary movie alright. It must be some lens flare thingy. I said, but deep down I was scared too. Susan queried, guys where is Lily and Rose? Must be somewhere here, Ashwin said. I haven't seen them after we came back to camp, Tom responded in a worried manner. Come Susan. Let's check the hut out, Emily grabbed on Susan's hand and they went to find Lily and Rose. No sooner did they leave the common room did we hear the same growling sound followed by loud shrieks. We ran outside to see Emily fainted and Susan holding her. Then I saw the lifeless body of Rose. Blood splattered everywhere. As if she has jumped from a tall building. Another bone chilling growl and then I froze. I saw Lily flying. Something had thrown her from a tree and she came crashing down just beside Rose. I couldn't scream. This was something which I had never expected to witness. This couldn't be a dream as I don't have the imagination to imagine something as gruesome as this. The counselors came running out and asked us to check if anyone else is missing. It was a huge mess. Everyone was shouting. It took some time for us to settle down. We were scared to death. The bodies were moved to the infirmary in the main building. Everyone else was accounted for. David and the three others who left with him returned and they called the mainland for the ferry. The camp was obviously cancelled. The growling continued. We were told to pack up our stuff and we would leave after three hours. It wasn't easy to wait for three long hours. We have to hike south to go to the dock. They should send the army to kill this thing, Emily said still shaking. The growling continued. Maybe this thing has given birth or something and felt threatened when we came here, Susan said. Stop trying to justify murder, I shouted. I know she was just trying to help. Trying to make sense of it all. But, I was scared shitless. I am sorry. I am just scared, I apologized. Susan put her hand on mine. It's okay. I understand. We were all called outside and David announced, given the circumstances. We will not hike to the dock. We will wait here for help to arrive. The sheriff's department along with the forest rangers will be arriving soon and they will escort us out of here. Till then, Stay here and stay quiet. Please don't wander off anywhere. If you have to go back to the hut then inform a counselor. Don't go out alone. This was good news. After a few tense hours we were escorted out to the ferry and returned home. On the way back we were told it was a bear which must have done it. But it was a bizarre scenario. No one has ever heard anything like this before. I don't buy it one bit. Something is definitely wrong in that island. I have promised myself. No more summer camps. But, I still have nightmares and I feel that I am back at the camp. It is night time and something is throwing me down from the top of a tree. I'll never forget that fateful day in Illinois six years ago, the day I stood at the grave of my beloved wife, Lulu. Her passing had been sudden a cruel twist of fate that had ripped her from my life. It was a pain I thought I would never recover from, and I was there at the funeral, watching in disbelief as the casket was lowered into the cold earth. The sound of dirt hitting the coffin lid haunted me for years. Life had other plans for me, and I soon found myself in Kansas, trying to leave behind the memories of Lulu. I had been living there for three years, merely going through the motions of existence. 
There was nothing extraordinary about this part of my story, such things happen every day. But then came the strange part, the inexplicable events that have left me puzzled and restless. It all started when I received a letter from my old home in Illinois, postmarked and signed with Lulu's name, unmistakably in her handwriting. I was certain of it because I compared it with letters she had written me before our marriage, letters I had kept as precious mementos. In that letter, Lulu claimed to be lonely and missing me terribly, urging me to return to her. But it contained a sentence that sent shivers down my spine, you all thought I died, but I did not, and am much better than when I saw you last. I couldn't fathom what that meant. How could someone who had been buried come back to life? Initially, I believed it to be a sick joke, perhaps the work of some friends back in Illinois. However, as more letters arrived, my unease grew. These letters, filled with affection and longing, provided no answers, only more questions. One particularly unnerving letter reached me from Concordia, Kansas, near where I used to live before coming to Nebraska. The writer lamented the fact that I had left before she could reach me, and the handwriting remained identical to Lulu's. This couldn't be a prank, it was something more sinister and inexplicable. My anxiety grew, and I sent some of the letters back to Lulu's parents, who confirmed the handwriting as their daughters but were as mystified as I was. Frustration gnawed at me, pushing me to address one of the letters to Mrs. W. S. Amison. That letter, too, came back, returned from the dead letter office. The last letter, received about three weeks ago, was dated from Table Rock, Nebraska, and stated that Lulu was there, sick and in dire need of help. I rushed to Table Rock, determined to get to the bottom of this bizarre mystery. Upon my arrival, I learned that a woman matching Lulu's description had been staying at a local hotel. She was sick, rarely leaving her room, and departed suddenly without revealing her destination. The hotel register had an entry under the name Mrs. Lulu Amison, with no address provided. It was the same handwriting, and the woman's description closely matched that of my dear Lulu from the last time I had seen her. Frustration and confusion gave way to a resolute determination. I decided to return to Illinois and had Lulu's remains exhumed, only to find her as she had been buried years ago. There was no mistaking that fact. Now, I stand at the crossroads of this inexplicable enigma, and my curiosity and apprehension gnaw at me. Who had been sending those letters, and who was the woman who had been using Lulu's name? I am not a superstitious man, but this bewildering mystery has shaken me to my core. My reputation remains untarnished, and my employer vouches for my character. Should I receive any more letters, I am resolved not to let them torment me but to uncover the truth behind this eerie riddle. And when I do, I have promised to share my findings with the world. I'm writing today because I just read the story from the lady who is claiming the moth man lived in her backyard. I don't completely disbelieve her claims as I'm in no position to do so. That's up to you and your investigators. I do know we have lots of underground creatures and many unexplained things in the woods. I wanted to tell you about an experience I had when I still lived back home in Wayne, West Virginia. It was around 2003. It was fall, I think. Being that I grew up in the WV Mountains, I've always been aware of the stories of the Mothman, creatures similar to the Mothman, and what my great-grandmother called panthers. I don't know what these panthers really were, but she had a ton of stories about her father having to outsmart them and keep them away while traveling through the woods to get to town. I know she wasn't describing a mountain lion or bobcat. We all know what those are, and as far as I know, those hills aren't roaming grounds for mountain lions. They always said these creatures were vicious. They'd snatch who and whatever they could. However, they were afraid of fire. So, it's fall. My ex-husband and I had been at my aunt's house for a birthday party. She lives on a country road with the mountains behind the house. For miles, there's nothing but woods back there. We were the first to leave. It was around dusk, and I was following my ex-husband out to the car while carrying my two-year-old son. 
Right before we reached the car we were stopped dead in our tracks by the creepiest sound I have ever heard. It was so loud, echoing off the hills. It sounded very similar to a woman screaming bloody murder, just like the stories my great-grandmother told, but was definitely not a woman. It was one of those sounds that just feels ominous and sends those cold chills down your spine. I looked at my ex-husband and could tell it frightened him, that's what scared me more than anything. He was an avid woodsman and hunter. He knew the woods, could happily live in a tent in the woods, and wasn't afraid of much in life in general. I started searching the tree line with my eyes just trying to see if I could see it. I could feel it staring right down at us. Yet, we were both kind of frozen in shock. Then, he gave me a look and told me to get my son and myself in the car immediately. I did but thought we probably should have told everyone in the house to be careful when they went to leave. That was the only time in the 25 years I lived in WV that I heard that sound. Though, I continued to hear stories over the years. I don't know what that thing really is, and I don't want to find out personally. I also had a neighbor in 2006 that told me some pretty scary stuff. She said she was living in a house on Buffalo Creek Road. In Wayne County, West Virginia. This is a back road. Woods and mountains on both sides. My family owned quite a bit of land out there. There were mounds up on the mountains where the Native Americans buried their dead. She said there was an old cabin a little ways behind and to the right of the house. She was there alone. It was dark and getting late, so she decided to go to bed. She said as soon as she turned the lights off, she started hearing lots of racket coming from the cabin. Like pots and pans clanging together, glass breaking, etc. She thought it was a group of rowdy teens messing around in there. So, she went out on the porch and yelled to tell them to hit the road. The noise stopped, but she didn't see any kids. She went back in to grab a flashlight and went closer to the cabin to investigate. She could see something dark move past the windows. She shined the light in and it apparently looked right out the window at her. She booked it back to the house and locked herself in. She described it as Mothman-like but she didn't think for sure that's what it was. She said it was pure evil. You could feel it. She said it was taller than her. All dark in color. Red eyes walked upright. I believed her. She wasn't one to make things up, and she was clearly frightened to tell the story. To make matters worse, that wasn't the last encounter that she had with the creature. There was another night when she was babysitting her nieces and nephews. She said it came up on the porch and started pacing back and forth. You could hear the boards creak with every step. They locked everything up, and all ran into her bedroom and locked themselves in. They all were huddled together on the bed when it came around to the window. I guess it rapped on the window and scratched at it. They literally all hid under the covers. I guess they were all screaming and freaking out. She said it eventually went back to the front porch and was there until close to dawn. It wasn't long after that they moved. Now, I will say that I loved being in those woods on Buffalo Creek. During the day. We always had fun. We'd find arrowheads and all kinds of different treasures the Indians left behind. At night, however, we wanted to be inside. I hated the back room. Closest to the woods, my great-grandfather built several houses on that road. My family still lives there. It just always felt like there was something out there at night. The natural noises would get quiet all of a sudden. It just always seemed scary at night. Even as an adult, I would run from the car to the house. I don't know what's out there, but I'd say there are too many stories and witnesses to discount it. The strange incident took place near Powelton, West Virginia in December 1934. I was eight years old. At the time, my father worked for Elkhorn Piney Coal in McDunn. He and the other miners would take a train to the mine each day. The day before Christmas Eve my father mentioned an unusual sighting he and the others on the train had while traveling back to Powelton from the mine that evening. As they looked out towards the east they noticed a very large bird flying above the trees. 
My father was a very simple man and didn't believe in any nonsense but this large bird really caught his attention. He described it as a freakish sized owl very dark in color. The sky was getting dark but they could still make out the large form. He said it also looked at the train as it flew over the trees. Nobody on the train could figure out what it was. The mere fact that my father even mentioned it suggested that it must have been an unusual sight. My father was scheduled off from work for three days during the Christmas holiday. On December 27th, he was getting ready for work but said he felt poorly. My mother was concerned because he had a high fever and awful chills. She insisted he stay home and telephone the doctor. My father was reluctant to stay home and put up a good argument but my mother was not going to back down. She put him to bed and waited for the doctor. Well, we waited for hours until the telephone rang. The operator told my mother that the doctor was at McDonough. There had been a horrible train explosion. She couldn't talk but said that the doctor's wife asked her to contact us. My mother was pale when she told my father what had happened. I remember they both started praying and crying. For years both of them thought the large bird was an angel sent by God as a warning and that my father's life was saved for a reason. My father never went back to the mine. It turned out that he had contracted polio though he was very lucky since he survived it with only a slight limp. We soon moved away to a small town in Kentucky where my father found the calling and became a Pentecostal preacher. He told his story of survival to anyone who would listen until the day he died. I happened to read your stories while looking on the internet with my great-grandson. I always assumed my father saw something more divine. That's what he always believed. I'm not so sure now. Around 1994 I was living near Nashville, Tennessee in a small neighborhood called Antioch. This is in Davidson County. I was out walking my dog one day letting the dog do its business out in the front yard when I could sense something was watching me. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and everyone around there was at work except me. I could just feel something watching me. I started looking at the woods directly in front of me. I couldn't see anything, but I did hear leaves rustling in the trees. So I started looking up towards the tops of the trees. The only way I could describe it, and I don't even know if the movie had come out yet, was the cloaked alien in the Predator film. In the movie, they saw that invisible creature where you could see the outline of everything but you can see right through it. It was sitting up in the very tops of the trees where it wouldn't hold the weight of a man by any means. This thing was as big as a man. I just stood there looking at it when I saw a quick flash of its eyes. It was a sudden bright yellow glow. I let go of the leash and I took off on a dead run towards this thing. It literally started running across the tops of the trees. I know what I saw. While running, I thought about what I was doing. I then thought what in the world are you doing chasing this thing? I stopped and it stopped, about a length of a football field away from where it started. It turned around and looked at me again with the flashing yellow eyes and then it took off out through the woods through the tops of the trees out into the deeper woods. I didn't see it again. It scared the hell out of me. I never ever told anybody about it because I thought people would think I was crazy. This occurred in September 2022 in the Wood Creek Reserve neighborhood in Katy. It was approximately 11.30 p.m. So I saw this girl standing by the side of the road. She looked like she may have been a preteen. I pulled over because I thought I could help her. She was just standing there and I thought it was weird that a kid would be standing by the side of the road that time of night, so I pulled over to see if I could help. The first thing I did is I called it in. When I looked up she had moved and she was in front of the patrol car standing in the headlights. She was looking at me. She didn't seem afraid or worried and I thought that was weird, so I told dispatch. I went to get out of the car and just as I was starting to open my door I saw her eyes. At that point, I didn't want to get out of the car. I realized that her eyes were totally black. I mean completely black. She must have seen that I realized that because she started to approach the car. 
It took everything I could do not to drive away at that point. I mean, I'm a peace officer of the law. It's my job but it was this visceral thing that just took over. I can't describe it but all of my training had just gone out the window. Everything in me just wanted to get the hell away from that girl, but I stayed. I rolled down the window. As she approached me I asked her where she lived and she mumbled something. I leaned forward and then she suddenly attacked me. This ungodly voice was then coming out of her. I had no idea how a human could make that voice but I was trying to push her off of me. She was trying to pull me out of the car. I was screaming at her to get off me get off me and then she said something. I can't get those words out of my mind. She said, we're going to die tonight. Why would she say that to me? I struggled to break her grip. Then I heard a loud crack. Then she went limp and she fell onto the road. I thought that I may have seriously hurt her. I quickly got out of the car to see if she was okay. Then, suddenly, she stood up like nothing had happened and she ran away into the dark night. But I could hear her laughing. She was not human, I'm telling you. When I got back to the station, I told my supervisor what had happened. He told me to ignore it and to not write up an incident report. I still patrol the same area. I believe that she is still out there, roaming in the night. She was just not human. These incidents took place during my childhood years up until the day I graduated from high school in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We lived in an old three-story brownstone apartment building with a basement apartment. The whole building was owned by the family. Initially, my grandmother's sister lived in the basement with her family and her two brothers occupied the second floor. My family was on the first main floor and my grandmother was on the third floor. She believed in the superstition that if you moved down a level if you lived in an apartment you would soon die. She continued to climb the three flights of stairs even though she was very arthritic. As the years passed by her sister and her immediate family eventually moved out and the two brothers on the middle floor passed away. The basement level was now empty and my mother, father, sister, brother, and I continued to live on the first floor. The second floor was empty and my grandmother still resided alone on the third floor. There was never a thought of renting the vacant rooms. On several nights, while we were asleep, out of nowhere the front door would slam waking everyone up. After a few seconds, there would be footsteps moving up the metal stairs followed by footsteps, shuffling and creaking above us on the second floor. My father would jump up and rush to see who broke into the house. No one was ever there of course and things would be quiet again for a few weeks and then it would happen all over again. The apartment was usually cold and drafty so we would all stand next to a wood stove in the pantry because it was our heat source. On several occasions, we would see a faint apparition of someone walking towards the stove. Once in a while we would think someone had come home and would say hello only to be greeted by nothing. When I turned 10 years old my mother was sleeping on the third level to help care for my grandmother. My mother recalled one incident when she woke and saw me standing beside her bed. She asked what I wanted, I turned, walked away, and disappeared. There was another incident where she rushed out of the bathroom on the first floor and was frantic because she heard her mom scream for her. My sister and I were shocked because we didn't hear anything. On another occasion, my grandmother's aunt had been sick and was in the hospital. We were driving home and my mother was resting her head against the window when suddenly she rose up and shouted oh my god, Aunt Jane just died. I just saw her face. My father looked at the clock and it was about 7 pm. When we got home the charge nurse was calling to let us know that she had passed away at the exact time. The most memorable incident happened when my brother and I were talking about the weird stuff that had occurred in the house over the years. I said, yeah like the old guy who used to watch us sleep. I was sort of half joking since I wasn't sure if he had ever known since it was never brought up between us. He turns and answers you mean the guy that stood behind the dresser in the living room, who leaned over with his hands behind his back. As he was talking he, duplicated the way the apparition moved exactly. That really freaked me out.
This has happened in a village in Bangladesh. Basically a 13-year-old girl apparently met a figure while going to the toilet at school. She then started to talk to herself. Got sick and body bloated up within three months then died. Parents could not afford to have her tested in hospital. Now parents and two remaining siblings are acting strangly, both siblings are also sick. Saying they all will also go, telling all visitors to get lost. Basically the family lives next door to our family home. Money has been offered for hospital treatment. Thought I would share. This is second-hand information which my mother got. I personally think an supernatural entity caused this in first place. We'll provide update if possible. Thought I would share, my first post. I'm a retired 62-year-old dairy farmer. Back in 1980 an old girlfriend and I wanted to spotlight some deer. Around 11 p.m. we turned on a road and I turned the light on along the driver's side. At about 150 to 200 yards was someone or something walking in an alfalfa field moving up a slight hill. When I hit it with the light it turned a little and looked at us. It was dark colored from head to toe. I can't remember if there was any eye shine or not. It never changed its speed of walking. If it was a man you would think it would have waved or something and would have probably had a flashlight. Anyway, my girlfriend freaked out and screamed to get the hell out of there, so I did. I got down the road about a quarter mile and realized that I had the binoculars right on the dash and in all the commotion I forgot to use them. Just two years ago I came across a comment about a sighting about the same year by a bow hunter. It's just down the road about two miles from where we saw that thing. When Close Encounters of the Third Kind was released my aunt was in town, me starting elementary school. I went with my aunt and grandparents to see it. Aunt Jan started acting all freaked out during the movie, I thought, whatever, she was the hippie in our uptight family. After we got home Aunt Jan blurted out, those were the things talking to me from my bedroom TV as a kid on the farm. My grandparents did the parental look and finally my grandmother said, Jan, we didn't own a single TV when we lived there. They came to your window. That surprised me. My dad and mom moved into the farm after my grandparents built their new house. My bedroom was once Aunt Jan's. I never saw anything. My dad was driving from San Diego, California to Lubbock, Texas and while driving across White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, yes, you once could cross, he experienced four hours of lost time but had a full tank of gas on the other side. Skip to about three years later. The southern high rolling plains of Texas, near Lubbock, had a serious amount of cattle mutilations, many across the railroad tracks from our farm, home. Mom was a veterinarian and was called out by the sheriff to do necropsies. Zero footprints, not even the bovines, zero blood on the ground, yet none in the animals, reproductive organs removed, and no bleeding around said wounds. Laser surgery did not exist back then. The press called it satanic. But if so, where was the blood and footprints? A full-grown bull is an easy half-ton plus, gallons of blood. Yet not a drop was found. Taking a half-ton bull to the ground isn't easy, even for the best cowboy. We were told by the public school system that we were part of an intelligence test. It started in the sixth grade. USAF officers, my granddad was USAF, I know USAF, would show up 2x per year and give us the test. There were only 14 of us. We all topped 160 on the IQ test. Outside of band or sports, we were sequestered from all our classmates. We had our own classes. I went on to work in hospital finance. Several of my classmates went to MIT and Stanford. I'm an American. Me and my ex were traveling down a simple highway in the countryside of Scotland. The highway we were on, a 8-2 I believe, was situated in between Loch Ness and a forest. It was a narrow, winding road in a remote area. There had been nothing around for many miles, 
including other vehicles. We were both in quite a good mood, listening to a podcast or news radio, in a happy space, like being on autopilot. Anyway, as we rounded a corner, an old woman appeared seemingly out of nowhere and she appeared to be screaming at us and gesturing exaggeratedly toward the other side of the road. We were shocked to see her, obviously, and my ex tensed up but didn't react except to adjust our lane quickly. We were driving on the wrong side of the road. No sooner than we switched lanes and we made it to the next bend in the highway, an 18-wheeler came hauling ass around the curve. Had we not moved over, we would have been dead on the spot. After we made it through this moment, we debriefed, my ex is a devout skeptic, and neither one of us had an explanation, and we never spoke of it again. The old woman had shoulder-length gray hair and I don't remember what she was wearing, but she looked plain outside of her appearing spontaneously. I don't have a logical explanation of where she could have come from. I doubt that Scotland employs a special fleet of feral woodland traffic grandmas. It was a couple years ago around July, I started waking up with my blankets and pillows thrown off my bed, and sometimes while I was going to bed I would feel like I can only describe as pinching and zapping, like something was zapping me. But what made me extremely suspicious was I was reading a book one night and I grabbed my cup of water on the side of the bed and specifically remember drinking the last drop and putting it down on my dresser. I went to bed and when I woke up I went to school and the day went on as normal, but when it was night again I walked into my room and my cup had been filled with water. I told my family about it and they had no idea, I can't see them filling up my water either. I was extremely suspicious and I started sleeping with a Bible under my pillow because I always felt like something was watching me while I slept. I don't have a record of sleepwalking, so I don't think it's that but maybe. I've been looking into it and can't come up with a solution. What do you think? Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.